Section zero of the Lay of the Last Minstrel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lay of the Last Minstrel by Sir Walter Scott. Section zero. Introduction. Introduction to the Lay of the Last Minstrel. A poem of nearly thirty years' standing may be supposed hardly to need an introduction, since without one, it has been able to keep itself afloat through the best part of a generation. Nevertheless, as, in the edition of the Waverley novels now in the course of publication, I have imposed on myself the task of saying something concerning the purpose and history of each, in their turn, I am desirous that the poems for which I first received some marks of public favour should also be accompanied with such scraps of their literary history as may be supposed to carry interest along with them. Even if I should be mistaken in thinking that the secret history of what was once so popular may still attract public attention and curiosity, it seems to me not without its use to record the manner and circumstances under which the present, and other poems on the same plan, attained for a season an extensive reputation. I must resume the story of my literary labours at the period of which I broke off in the essay on the imitation of popular poetry, see Poetical Works, volume 4, page 78, when I had enjoyed the first gleam of public favour by the success of the first edition of the Minstrelsy of the Scottish Border. The second edition of that work, published in 1803, proved, in the language of the trade, rather a heavy concern. The demand in Scotland had been supplied by the first edition, and the curiosity of the English was not much awakened by poems in the rude garb of antiquity, accompanied with notes referring to the obscure feuds of barbarous clans, of whose very names civilised history was ignorant. It was, on the whole, one of those books which are more praised than they are read. At this time I stood personally in a different position from that which I occupied when I first dipped my desperate pen in ink for other purposes than those of my profession. In 1796, when I first published the translations from Bürger, I was an insulated individual, with only my own wants to provide for, and having, in a great measure, my own inclinations alone to consult. In 1803, when the second edition of The Minstrelsy appeared, I had arrived at a period of life when men however thoughtless, encounter duties and circumstances which press consideration and plans of life upon the most careless minds. I had been for some time married, was the father of a rising family, and though fully enabled to meet the consequent demands upon me, it was my duty and desire to place myself in a situation which would enable me to make honourable provision against the various contingencies of life. It may be readily supposed that the attempts which I had made in literature had been unfavourable to my success at the bar. The goddess Themis is, at Edinburgh, and I suppose everywhere else, of a peculiarly jealous disposition. She will not readily consent to share her authority, and sternly demands from her votary not only that real duty be carefully attended to and discharged, but that a certain air of business shall be observed even in the midst of total idleness. It is prudent, if not absolutely necessary, in a young barrister, to appear completely engrossed by his profession. However destitute of employment he may in reality be, he ought to preserve, if possible, the appearance of full occupation. He should therefore seem perpetually engaged among his law papers, dusting them, as it were, and as Ovid advises the fair, si nullus eric pulis, tamen excute nullum. Perhaps such extremity of attention is more especially required, considering the great number of counsellors who are called to the bar, and how very small a proportion of them are finally disposed, or find encouragement, to follow the law as a profession. Hence, the number of deserters is so great, that the least lingering look behind occasions a young novice to be set down as one of the intending fugitives. Certain it is that the Scottish Themis was at this time peculiarly jealous of any flirtation with the muses, on the part of those who had ranged themselves under her banners. This was probably owing to her consciousness of the superior attractions of her rivals. Of late, however, she has relaxed in some instances in this particular, an eminent example of which has been shown in the case of my friend Mr. Jeffrey, who, after long conducting one of the most influential literary periodicals of the age with unquestionable ability has been by the general consent of his brethren 
recently elected to be their dean of faculty or president being the highest acknowledgment of his professional talents which they had it in their power to offer but this is an incident much beyond the ideas of a period of thirty years distance when a barrister who really possessed any turn for lighter literature was at as much pains to conceal it as if it had in reality been something to be ashamed of and i could mention more than one instance in which literature and society have suffered much loss that jurisprudence might be enriched such however was not my case for the reader will not wonder that my open interference with matters of light literature diminished my employment in the weightier matters of the law nor did the solicitors upon whose choice the counsel takes rank in his profession do me less than justice by regarding others among my contemporaries as fitter to discharge the duty due to their clients than a young man who was taken up with running after ballads whether teutonic or national my profession and i therefore came to stand nearly upon the footing which honest slender consoled himself on having established with mistress anne page there was no great love between us at the beginning and it pleased heaven to decrease it on farther acquaintance i became sensible that the time was come when i must either buckle myself resolutely to the toil by day the lamp by night renouncing all the delibabs of my imagination or bid adieu to the profession of the law and hold another course i confess my own inclination revolted from the more severe choice which might have been deemed by many the wiser alternative as my transgressions had been numerous my repentance must have been signalized by unusual sacrifices i ought to have mentioned that since my fourteenth or fifteenth year my health originally delicate had become extremely robust from infancy i had laboured under the infirmity of a severe lameness but as i believe is usually the case with men of spirit who suffer under personal inconveniences of this nature i had since the improvement of my health in defiance of this incapacitating circumstance distinguished myself by the endurance of toil on foot or horseback having often walked thirty miles a day and rode upwards of a hundred without resting in this manner i made many pleasant journeys through parts of the country then not very accessible gaining more amusement and instruction than i have been able to acquire since i have travelled in a more commodious manner i practised most sylvan sports also with some success and with great delight but these pleasures must have been all resigned or used with great moderation had i determined to regain my station at the bar it was even doubtful whether i could with perfect character as a jurist consult retain a situation in a volunteer corps of cavalry which i then held the threats of invasion were at this time instant and menacing the call by britain on her children was universal and was answered by some who like myself consulted rather their desire than their ability to bear arms my services however were found useful in assisting to maintain the discipline of the corps being the point on which their constitution rendered them most amenable to military criticism in other respects the squadron was a fine one consisting chiefly of handsome men well mounted and armed at their own expense my attention to the corps took up a good deal of time and while it occupied many of the happiest hours of my life it furnished an additional reason for my reluctance again to encounter the severe course of study indispensable to success in the juridical profession on the other hand my father whose feelings might have been hurt by my quitting the bar had been for two or three years dead so that i had no control to thwart my own inclination and my income being equal to all the comforts and some of the elegances of life i was not pressed to an irksome labour by necessity that most powerful of motives consequently i was the more easily seduced to choose the employment which was the most agreeable to me this was yet the easier that in eighteen hundred i had obtained the preferment of sheriff of selkirkshire about three hundred pounds a year in value and which was the more agreeable to me as in that county i had several friends and relations but i did not abandon the profession to which i had been educated without certain prudential resolutions which at the risk of some egotism i will here mention not without the hope that they may be useful to young persons who may stand in circumstances similar to those in which i then stood in the first place upon considering the lives and fortunes of persons who had given themselves up to literature or the task of pleasing the public it seemed to me that the circumstances which chiefly affected their happiness and character were those from which horace has bestowed upon authors the epithet of the irritable race 
it requires no depth of philosophic reflection to perceive that the petty warfare of pope with the dunces of his period could not have been carried on without his suffering the most acute torture such as a man must endure from mosquitoes by whose stings he suffers agony although he could crush them in his grasp by myriads nor is it necessary to call to memory the many humiliating instances in which men of the greatest genius have to avenge some pitiful quarrel made themselves ridiculous during their lives to become the still more degraded objects of pity to future times upon the whole as i had no pretension to the genius of the distinguished persons who had fallen into such errors i concluded there could be no occasion for imitating them in their mistakes or what i considered as such and in adopting literary pursuits as the principal occupation of my future life i resolved if possible to avoid those weaknesses of temper which seemed to have most easily beset my more celebrated predecessors with this view it was my first resolution to keep as far as was in my power abreast of society continuing to maintain my place in general company without yielding to the very natural temptation of narrowing myself to what is called literary society by doing so i imagined i should escape the besetting sin of listening to language which from one motive or another is apt to ascribe a very undue degree of consequence to literary pursuits as if they were indeed the business rather than the amusement of life the opposite course can only be compared to the injudicious conduct of one who pampers himself with cordial and luscious draughts until he is unable to endure wholesome bitters like gil blas therefore i resolved to stick by the society of my commis instead of seeking that of a more literary caste and to maintain my general interest in what was going on around me reserving the man of letters for the desk and the library my second resolution was a corollary from the first i determined that without shutting my ears to the voice of true criticism i would pay no regard to that which assumes the form of satire i therefore resolved to arm myself with that triple brass of horace of which those of my profession are seldom held deficient against all the roving warfare of satire parody and sarcasm to laugh if the jest was a good one or if otherwise to let it hum and buzz itself to sleep it is to the observance of these rules according to my best belief that after a life of thirty years engaged in literary labours of various kinds I attribute my never having been entangled in any literary quarrel or controversy and which is still a more pleasing result that i have been distinguished by the personal friendship of my most approved contemporaries of all parties i adopted at the same time another resolution on which it may doubtless be remarked that it was well for me that i had it in my power to do so and that therefore it is a line of conduct which depending upon accident can be less generally applicable in other cases yet i fail not to record this part of my plan convinced that though it may not be in every one's power to adopt exactly the same resolution he may nevertheless by his own exertions in some shape or other attain the object on which it was founded namely to secure the means of subsistence without relying exclusively on literary talents in this respect i determined that literature should be my staff but not my crutch and that the profits of my literary labour however convenient otherwise should not if i could help it become necessary to my ordinary expenses with this purpose i resolved if the interest of my friends could so far favour me to retire upon any of the respectable offices of the law in which persons of that profession are glad to take refuge when they feel themselves or are judged by others incompetent to aspire to its higher honours upon such a post an author might hope to retreat without any perceptible alteration of circumstances whenever the time should arrive that the public grew weary of his endeavours to please or he himself should tire of the pen at this period of my life i possessed so many friends capable of assisting me in this object of ambition that i could hardly overrate my own prospects of obtaining the preferment to which i limited my wishes and in fact i obtained in no long period the reversion of a situation which completely met them thus far all was well and the author had been guilty perhaps of no great imprudence when he relinquished his forensic practice with the hope of making some figure in the field of literature but an established character with the public in my new capacity still remained to be acquired 
i have noticed that the translation from burger had been unsuccessful nor had the original poetry which appeared under the auspices of mr lewis in the tales of wonder in any degree raised my reputation it is true i had private friends disposed to second me in my efforts to obtain popularity but i was sportsman enough to know that if the greyhound does not run well the halloos of his patrons will not obtain the prize for him neither was i ignorant that the practice of ballad writing was for the present out of fashion and that any attempt to revive it or to found a poetical character upon it would certainly fail of success the ballad measure itself which was once listened to as an enchanting melody had become hackneyed and sickening from its being the accompaniment of every grinding hand organ and besides a long work in quatrains whether those of the common ballad or such as are termed elegiac has an effect upon the mind like that of the bed of procrustes upon the human body or as it must be both awkward and difficult to carry on a long sentence from one stanza to another it follows that the meaning of each period must be comprehended within four lines and equally so that it must be extended so as to fill that space the alternate dilation and contraction thus rendered necessary is singularly unfavourable to narrative composition and the gondibert of sir william davenant though containing many striking passages has never become popular owing chiefly to its being told in this species of elegiac verse in the dilemma occasioned by this objection the idea occurred to the author of using the measured short line which forms the structure of so much minstrel poetry that it may be properly termed the romantic stanza by way of distinction and which appears so natural to our language that the very best of our poets have not been able to protract into it the verse properly called heroic without the use of epithets which are to say the least unnecessary but on the other hand the extreme facility of the short couplet which seems congenial to our language and was doubtless for that reason so popular with our old minstrels is for the same reason apt to prove a snare to the composer who uses it in more modern days by encouraging him in a habit of slovenly composition the necessity of occasional pauses often forces the young poet to pay more attention to sense as the boy's kite rises highest when the train is loaded by a due counterpoise the author was therefore intimidated by what byron calls the fatal facility of the octosyllabic verse which was otherwise better adapted to his purpose of imitating the more ancient poetry i was not less at a loss for a subject which might admit of being treated with the simplicity and wildness of the ancient ballad but accident dictated both the theme and measure which decided the subject as well as the structure of the poem the lovely young countess of dalkeith afterwards harriet duchess of buccleuch had come to the land of her husband with the desire of making herself acquainted with its traditions and customs as well as its manners and history all who remember this lady will agree that the intellectual character of her extreme beauty the amenity and courtesy of her manners the soundness of her understanding and her unbounded benevolence gave more the idea of an angelic visitant than of a being belonging to this netherworld and such a thought was but too consistent with the short space she was permitted to tarry among us of course where all made it a pride and pleasure to gratify her wishes she soon heard enough of border law among others an aged gentleman of property near langholm communicated to her ladyship the story of gilpin horner a tradition in which the narrator and many more of that country were firm believers the young countess much delighted with the legend and the gravity and full confidence with which it was told enjoined on me as a task to compose a ballad on the subject of course to hear was to obey and thus the goblin story objected to by several critics as an excrescence upon the poem was in fact the occasion of its being written a chance similar to that which dictated the subject gave me also the hint of a new mode of treating it we had at that time the lease of a pleasant cottage near laswade on the romantic banks of the esk to which we escaped when the vacations of the court permitted me so much leisure here i had the pleasure to receive a visit from mr stoddart now sir john stoddart judge advocate at malta who was at that time collecting the particulars which he afterwards embodied in his remarks on local scenery in scotland i was of some use to him in procuring the information which he desired and guiding him to the scenes which he wished to see 
in return he made me better acquainted than i had hitherto been with the poetic effusions which have since made the lakes of westmoreland and the authors by whom they have been sung so famous wherever the english tongue is spoken i was already acquainted with the joan of arc the thalaba and the metrical ballads of mr southey which had found their way to scotland and were generally admired but mr stoddart who had the advantage of personal friendship with the authors and who possessed a strong memory with an excellent taste was able to repeat to me many long specimens of their poetry which had not yet appeared in print amongst others was the striking fragment called christabel by mr coleridge which from the singularly irregular structure of the stanzas and the liberty which it allowed the author to adapt the sound to the sense seemed to be exactly suited to such an extravaganza as i meditated on the subject of gilpin horner as applied to comic and humorous poetry this mescolanza of measures had been already used by anthony hall anstey dr walcott and others but it was in christabel that i first found it used in serious poetry and it is to mr coleridge that i am bound to make the acknowledgment due from the pupil to his master i observe that lord byron in noticing my obligations to mr coleridge which i have always been most ready to acknowledge expressed or was understood to express a hope that i did not write an unfriendly review on mr coleridge's productions on this subject i have only to say that i do not even know the review which is alluded to and were i ever to take the unbecoming freedom of censuring a man of mr coleridge's extraordinary talents it would be on account of the caprice and indolence with which he has thrown from him as if in mere wantonness those unfinished scraps of poetry which like the torso of antiquity defy the skill of his poetical brethren to complete them the charming fragments which the author abandons to their fate are surely too valuable to be treated like the proofs of careless engravers the sweepings of whose studios often make the fortune of some painstaking collector i did not immediately proceed upon my projected labour though i was now furnished with a subject and with a structure of verse which might have the effect of novelty to the public ear and afford the author an opportunity of varying his measure with the variations of a romantic theme on the contrary it was to the best of my recollection more than a year after mr stoddart's visit that by way of experiment i composed the first two or three stanzas of the lay of the last minstrel i was shortly afterwards visited by two intimate friends one of whom still survives they were men whose talents might have raised them to the highest station in literature had they not preferred exerting them in their own profession of the law in which they attained equal preferment i was in the habit of consulting them on my attempts at composition having equal confidence in their sound taste and friendly sincerity in this specimen i had in the phrase of the highland servant packed all that was my own at least for i had also included a line of invocation a little softened from coleridge mary mother shield us well as neither of my friends said much to me on the subject of the stanzas i showed them before their departure i had no doubt that their disgust had been greater than their good nature chose to express looking upon them therefore as a failure i threw the manuscript into the fire and thought as little more as i could of the matter some time afterwards i met one of my two counsellors who inquired with considerable appearance of interest about the progress of the romance i had commenced and was greatly surprised at learning its fate he confessed that neither he nor our mutual friend had been at first able to give a precise opinion on a poem so much out of the common road but that as they walked home together to the city they had talked much on the subject and the result was an earnest desire that i would proceed with the composition he also added that some sort of prologue might be necessary to place the mind of the hearers in the situation to understand and enjoy the poem and recommended the adoption of such quaint mottoes as spencer had used to announce the contents of the chapters of the fairy queen such as babe's bloody hands may not be cleansed the face of golden mean her sisters too extremities her strive to banish clean i entirely agreed with my friendly critic in the necessity of having some sort of pitch pipe which might make readers aware of the object or rather of the tone of the publication but i doubted whether in assuming the oracular style of spencer's mottoes the interpreter might not be censured as the harder to be understood of the two i therefore introduced the old minstrel as an appropriate prolocutor by whom the lay might be sung or spoken and the introduction of whom betwixt the cantos might remind the reader at intervals of the time place and circumstances of the recitation 
this species of cadre or frame afterwards afforded the poem its name of the lay of the last minstrel the work was subsequently shown to other friends during its progress and received the imprimatur of mr francis jeffrey who had been already for some time distinguished by his critical talent the poem being once licensed by the critics as fit for the market was soon finished proceeding at about the rate of a canto per week there was indeed little occasion for pause or hesitation when a troublesome rhyme might be accommodated by an alteration of the stanza or where an incorrect measure might be remedied by a variation in the rhyme it was finally published in eighteen o five and may be regarded as the first work in which the writer who has been since so voluminous laid his claim to be considered as an original author the book was published by longman and company and archibald constable and company the principal of the latter firm was then commencing that course of bold and liberal industry which was of so much advantage to his country and might have been so to himself but for causes which it is needless to enter into here the work brought out on the usual terms of division of profits between the author and publishers was not long after purchased by them for five hundred pounds to which messrs longman and company afterwards added one hundred pounds in their own unsolicited kindness in consequence of the uncommon success of the work it was handsomely given to supply the loss of a fine horse which broke down suddenly while the author was riding with one of the worthy publishers it would be great affectation not to own frankly that the author expected some success from the lay of the last minstrel the attempt to return to a more simple and natural style of poetry was likely to be welcomed at a time when the public had become tired of reading heroic hexameters with all the buckram and binding which belong to them of later days but whatever might have been his expectations whether moderate or unreasonable the result left them far behind for among those who smiled on the adventurous minstrel were numbered the great names of william pitt and charles fox neither was the extent of the sale inferior to the character of the judges who received the poem with approbation upwards of thirty thousand copies of the lay were disposed of by the trade and the author had to perform a task difficult to human vanity when called upon to make the necessary deductions from his own merits in a calm attempt to account for his popularity a few additional remarks on the author's literary attempts after this period will be found in the introduction to the poem of marmion abbotsford april eighteen thirty End of the introduction by the author. Section 1 of The Lay of the Last Minstrel by Sir Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To the Right Honourable Charles, Earl of Dalkeith, this poem is inscribed by the author. The poem now offered to the public is intended to illustrate the customs and manners which anciently prevailed on the borders of england and scotland the inhabitants living in a state partly pastoral and partly warlike and combining habits of constant depredation with the influence of a rude spirit of chivalry were often engaged in scenes highly susceptible of poetical ornament as the description of scenery and manners was more the object of the author than a combined and regular narrative the plan of the ancient metrical romance was adopted which allows greater latitude in this respect than would be consistent with the dignity of a regular poem the same model offered other facilities as it permits an occasional alteration of measure which in some degree authorizes the change of rhythm in the text the machinery also adopted from popular belief would have seemed puerile in a poem which did not partake of the rudeness of the old ballad or metrical romance for these reasons the poem was put into the mouth of an ancient minstrel the last of the race who as he is supposed to have survived the revolution might have caught somewhat of the refinement of modern poetry without losing the simplicity of its original model the date of the tale itself is about the middle of the sixteenth century when most of the personages actually flourished the time occupied by the action is three nights and three days the lay of the last minstrel a poem in six cantos dum relego scripsisse pudet quia plurima cheron me quoque qui feci iudice dignalini end of section one
Section two of the Lay of the Last Minstrel by Sir Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lay of the Last Minstrel, Canto First. Introduction. The way was long, the wind was cold. The minstrel was infirm and old. His withered cheek and tresses grey seemed to have known a better day the harp his sole remaining joy was carried by an orphan boy the last of all the bards was he who sung of border chivalry for well a day their date was fled his tuneful brethren all were dead and he neglected and oppressed wished to be with them and at rest no more on prancing palfrey borne he carolled light as lark at morn no longer courted and caressed high placed in hall a welcome guest he poured to lord and lady gay the unpremeditated lay old times were changed old manners gone a stranger filled the steward's throne the bigots of the iron time had called his harmless art a crime a wandering harper scorned and poor he begged his bread from door to door and tuned to please a peasant's ear the harp a king had loved to hear he passed where newark's stately tower looks out from yarrow's birchen bower the minstrel gazed with wishful eye no humbler resting-place was nigh with hesitating step at last the embattled portal arch he passed whose ponderous grate and massy bar had oft rolled back the tide of war but never closed the iron door against the desolate and poor the duchess marked his weary pace his timid mien and reverend face and bade her page the menials tell that they should tend the old man well for she had known adversity though born in such a high degree in pride of power in beauty's bloom had wept o'er monmouth's bloody tomb when kindness had his wants supplied and the old man was gratified began to rise his minstrel pride and he began to talk anon of good earl francis dead and gone and of earl walter rest him god a braver ne'er to battle road and how full many a tale he knew of the old warriors of Bricleu, and would the noble duchess deign to listen to an old man's strain though stiff his hand his voice though weak he thought even yet the sooth to speak that if she loved the harp to hear he could make music to her ear the humble boon was soon obtained the aged minstrel audience gained but when he reached the room of state where she with all her ladies sat perchance he wished his boon denied for when to tune his harp he tried his trembling hand had lost the ease which marks security to please and scenes long past of joy and pain came wildering over his aged brain he tried to tune his harp in vain the pitying duchess praised its chime and gave him heart and gave him time till every string's according glee was blended into harmony and then he said he would full fain he could recall an ancient strain he never thought to sing again it was not framed for village churls but for high dames and mighty earls he had played it to king charles the good when he kept court in holyrood and much he wished yet feared to try the long-forgotten melody amid the strings his fingers strayed and an uncertain warbling made and oft he shook his hoary head but when he caught the measure wild the old man raised his face and smiled and lightened up his faded eye with all a poet's ecstasy in varying cadence soft or strong he swept the sounding chords along the present scene the future lot his toils his wants were all forgot cold diffidence and age's frost in the full tide of song were lost each blank in faithless memory void the poet's glowing thought supplied and while his harp responsive rung twas thus the latest minstrel sung the lay of the last minstrel canto first one the feast was over in branksome tower and the lady had gone to her secret bower her bower that was guarded by word and by spell deadly to hear and deadly to tell jesu maria shield us well no living wight save the lady alone had dared to cross the threshold stone two 
the tables were drawn it was idless all knight and page and household squire loitered through the lofty hall or crowded round the ample fire the stag-hounds weary with the chase lay stretched upon the rushy floor and urged in dreams the forest race from teviotstone to eskdale moor three nine and twenty knights of fame hung their shields in Branksome hall nine and twenty squires of name brought them their steeds to bower from stall nine and twenty yeomen tall waited duteous on them all they were all knights of metal true kinsmen to the bold Buccleuch. four ten of them were sheathed in steel with belted sword and spur on heel they quitted not their harness bright neither by day nor yet by night they lay down to rest with corslet laced pillowed on buckler cold and hard they carved at the meal with gloves of steel and they drank the red wine through the helmet barred five ten squires ten yeomen mail-clad men waited the beck of the warders ten thirty steeds both fleet and white stood saddled in stable day and night barbed with frontlet of steel i trow as with jedwood axe at saddlebow a hundred more fed free in stall such was the custom of branksome hall six why do these steeds stand ready dight why watch these warriors armed by night they watch to hear the bloodhound baying they watch to hear the war-horn braying to see st george's red cross streaming to see the midnight beacon gleaming they watch against southern force and guile lest scroop or howard or percy's powers threaten branksome's lordly towers from warkworth or naworth or merry carlisle seven such is the custom of branksome hall many a valiant knight is here but he the chieftain of them all his sword hangs rusting on the wall beside his broken spear bards long shall tell how lord walter fell when startled burghers fled afar the furies of the border war when the streets of hyde and eden saw lances gleam and falchions redden and heard the slogan's deadly yell then the chief of branksome fell Eight can piety the discord heal or stanch the death feud's enmity can christian law can patriot zeal can love of blessed charity no vainly to each holy shrine in mutual pilgrimage they drew implored in vain the grace divine for chiefs their own red falchions slew while cessford owns the rule of car while ettrick boasts the line of scott the slaughtered chiefs the mortal jar the havoc of the feudal war shall never never be forgot nine in sorrow o'er lord walter's bier the warlike foresters had bent and many a flower and many a tear old teviot's maids and matrons lent but o'er her warrior's bloody bier the lady dropped nor flower nor tear vengeance deep brooding o'er the slain had locked the source of softer woe and burning pride and high disdain forbade the rising tear to flow until amid his sorrowing clan her son lisped from the nurse's knee and if i live to be a man my father's death revenged shall be then fast the mother's tears did seek to dew the infant's kindling cheek Ten all loose her negligent attire all loose her golden hair hung margaret o'er her slaughtered sire and wept in wild despair but not alone the bitter tear had filial grief supplied for hopeless love and anxious fear had lent their mingled tide nor in her mother's altered eye dared she to look for sympathy her love against her father's clan with car in arms had stood when mother's burn to melrose ran all purple with their blood and well she knew her mother dread before lord cranston she should wed would see her on her dying bed eleven of noble race the lady came her father was a clerk of fame of bethune's line of picardy he learnt the art that none may name in padua far beyond the sea 
men said he changed his mortal frame by feet of magic mystery for when in studious mood he paced st andrew's cloistered hall his form no darkening shadow traced upon the sunny wall twelve and of his skill as bards avow he taught that lady fair till to her bidding she could bow the viewless forms of air and now she sits in secret bower in old lord david's western tower and listens to a heavy sound that moans the mossy turrets round is it the roar of teviot's tide that chafes against the scar's red side is it the wind that swings the oaks is it the echo from the rocks what may it be the heavy sound that moans old branksome's turrets round thirteen at the sullen moaning sound the band dogs bay and howl and from the turrets round loud whoops the startled owl in the hall both squire and knight swore that a storm was near and looked forth to view the night but the night was still and clear fourteen from the sound of teviot's tide chafing with the mountain's side from the groan of the wind-swung oak from the sullen echo of the rock from the voice of the coming storm the lady knew it well it was the spirit of the flood that spoke and he called on the spirit of the fell fifteen river spirit sleep'st thou brother mountain spirit brother nay on my hills the moonbeams play from crack cross to skelfill pen by every rill in every glen merry elves their morris pacing to aerial minstrelsy emerald rings on brown heath tracing trip it deft and merrily up and mark their nimble feet up and list their music sweet sixteen river spirit tears of an imprisoned maiden mix with my polluted stream margaret of branksome sorrow-laden mourns beneath the moon's pale beam tell me thou who viewst the stars when shall cease these feudal jars what shall be the maiden's fate who shall be the maiden's mate seventeen mountain spirit arthur's slow wain his course doth roll in utter darkness round the pole the northern bear lowers black and grim orion's studded belt is dim twinkling faint and distant far shimmers through mist each planet star ill may i read their high decree but no kind influence deign they shower on teviot's tide and branksome's tower till pride be quelled and love be free eighteen the unearthly voices ceased and the heavy sound was still it died on the river's breast it died on the side of the hill but round lord david's tower the sound still floated near for it rung in the lady's bower and it rung in the lady's ear she raised her stately head and her heart throbbed high with pride your mountains shall bend and your streams ascend ere margaret be our foeman's bride nineteen the lady sought the lofty hall where many a bold retainer lay and with jocund din among them all her son pursued his infant play a fancied moss trooper the boy the truncheon of a spear bestrode and round the hall right merrily in mimic foray rode even bearded knights in arms grown old share in his frolic gambols bore albeit their hearts of rugged mould were stubborn as the steel they wore for the grey warriors prophesied how the brave boy in future war should tame the unicorn's pride exalt the crescent and the star twenty the lady forgot her purpose high one moment and no more one moment gazed with a mother's eye as she paused at the archered door then from amid the armoured train she called to her william of Deloraine. Twenty one. A stark moss trooping Scot was he, as e'er couched border lance by knee. Through Solway sands, through Taras moss, blindfold he knew the paths to cross. By wily turns, by desperate bounds, had baffled Percy's best bloodhounds. 
in Esk or Liddell, Fords were none, but he would ride them one by one. Alike to him was time or tide, December's snow or July's pride. Alike to him was tide or time, moonless midnight or matin prime. Steady of heart and stout of hand, as ever drove prey from Cumberland, five times outlawed had he been by England's king and Scotland's queen. 22. Sir William of Deloraine, good at need, mount thee on the whitest steed. Spare not to spur, nor stint to ride, until thou come to fair Tweedside, and in Melrose's holy pile seek thou the monk of St. Mary's Isle. Greet the father well from me. Say that the fated hour is come, and to-night he shall watch with thee to win the treasure of the tomb. For this will be St. Michael's night, and though stars be dim, the moon is bright, and the cross of bloody red will point to the grave of the mighty dead. 23. What he gives thee, see thou keep. Stay not thou for food or sleep, be it scroll or be it book, into it night thou must not look. If thou readest, thou art lorn. Better hadst thou ne'er been born. 24. O oh, swiftly can speed my dapple grey steed, which drinks of the teviot clear. Ere break of day, the warrior gan say, again will I be here, and safer by none may thy errand be done than noble dame by me. Letter nor line know I never a one wert my neck verse at Harry B. Twenty five. Soon in his saddle sat he fast, and soon the steep descent he passed, soon crossed the sounding barbican, and soon the teviot side he won. Eastward the wooded path he rode, green hazels o'er his basnet nod. He passed the peel of Golderland and crossed old Borthwick's roaring strand. Dimly he viewed the moat hill's mound, where druid's shades still flitted round. In Howick tinkled many a light, behind him soon they set in night, and soon he spurred his courser keen beneath the tower of Hazeldean. 26. The clattering hoofs the watchmen mark. Stand ho, thou courier of the dark. For Branksome, ho, the knight rejoined, and left the friendly tower behind. He turned him now from Teviot's side, and guided by the tinkling rill, northward the dark ascent did ride, and gained the moor at Horsley Hill. Broad on the left before him lay, for many a mile, the Roman way. 27. A moment now he slacked his speed, a moment breathed his panting steed, drew saddle girth and corslet band, and loosened in the sheath his brand. On Minto crags the moonbeams glint, where Barnhill hewed his bed of flint, where falcons hang their giddy nest, mid cliffs, from whence his eagle eye for many a league his prey could spy. Cliffs, doubling on their echoes, borne the terrors of the robber's horn, cliffs which for many a later year the warbling Doric reed shall hear, when some sad swain shall teach the grove ambition is no cure for love. 28. Unchallenged thence past Deloraine to ancient Riddell's fair domain, where Isle from mountains freed down from the lakes did raving come, each wave was crested with tawny foam, like the mane of a chestnut steed. In vain, no torrent, deep or broad, might bar the bold moss trooper's road. 29. At the first plunge the horse sunk low, and the water broke o'er the saddle bow. Above the foaming tide, I ween, scarce half the charger's neck was seen, for he was barded from counter to tail, and the rider was armed complete in mail. Never heavier man and horse stemmed a midnight torrent's force. The warrior's very plume, I say, was daggled by the dashing spray. Yet through good heart and our lady's grace, at length he gained the landing place. 30. Now Bowden Moore the marchman won, and sternly shook his plumed head, as glanced his eye o'er Halidon, for on his soul the slaughter red of that unhallowed morn arose, when first the Scot and Carr were foes, when Royal James beheld the fray, prize to the victor of the day, 
when hume and douglas in the van bore down Bicloo's retiring clan till gallant cessford's heart-blood dear reeked on dark elliot's border spear thirty one in bitter mood he spurred fast and soon the hated heath was past and far beneath in lustre wan old melrose rose and fair tweed ran like some tall rock with lichens grey seemed dimly huge the darker bay when howick he passed had curfew rung now midnight lords were in melrose sung the sound upon the fitful gale in solemn wise did rise and fail like that wild harp whose magic tone is wakened by the winds alone but when melrose he reached twas silence all he meetly stabled his steed in stall and sought the convent's lonely wall here paused the harp and with its swell the master's fire and courage fell dejectedly and low he bowed and gazing timid on the crowd he seemed to seek in every eye if they approved his minstrelsy and diffident of present praise somewhat he spoke of former days and how old age and wandering long had done his hand and harp some wrong the duchess and her daughters fair and every gentle lady there each after each in due degree gave praises to his melody his hand was true his voice was clear and much they longed the rest to hear encouraged thus the aged man after meet rest again began End of Canto First Section 3 of The Lay of the Last Minstrel by Sir Walter Scott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lay of the Last Minstrel, Canto Second 1. If thou wouldst view fair Melrose aright, go visit it by the pale moonlight. For the gay beams of lightsome day gild but to flout the ruins grey when the broken arches are black in night and each shafted oriel glimmers white when the cold light's uncertain shower streams on the ruined central tower when buttress and buttress alternately seem framed of ebon and ivory when silver edges the imagery and the scrolls that teach thee to live and die when distant tweed is heard to rave and the owlet to hoot o'er the dead man's grave then go but go alone the while then view st david's ruined pile and home returning soothly swear was never seen so sad and fair two short halt did delarain make there little recked he of the scene so fair with dagger's hilt on the wicket strong he struck full loud and struck full long the porter hurried to the gate who knocks so loud and knocks so late from branksome i the warrior cried and straight the wicket opened wide for branksome's chiefs had in battle stood to fence the rights of fair melrose and lands and livings many a rood had gifted the shrine for their soul's repose three bold de lorraine his errand said the porter bent his humble head with torch in hand and feet unshod and noiseless step the path he trod the archered cloister far and wide rang to the warrior's clanking stride till stooping low his lofty crest he entered the cell of the ancient priest and lifted his barred aventile to hail the monk of st mary's isle Four the lady of branksome greets thee by me says that the fated hour is come and that to-night i shall watch with thee to win the treasure of the tomb from sackcloth couch the monk arose with toil his stiffened limbs he reared a hundred years had flung their snows on his thin locks and floating beard five and strangely on the night looked he and his blue eyes gleamed wild and wide and darest thou warrior seek to see what heaven and hell alike would hide my breast in belt of iron pent with shirt of hair and scourge of thorn for threescore years in penance spent my knees those flinty stones have worn yet all too little to atone for knowing what should ne'er be known wouldst thou thy every future year in ceaseless prayer and penance dree 
yet wait thy latter end with fear then daring warrior follow me six penance father will i none prayer know i hardly won for mass or prayer can i rarely tarry save to patter an ave mary when i ride on a border foray other prayer can i none so speed me my errand and let me be gone seven again on the night looked the churchman old and again he sighed heavily for he had himself been a warrior bold and fought in spain and italy and he thought on the days that were long since by when his limbs were strong and his courage was high now slow and faint he led the way where cloistered round the garden lay the pillared arches were over their head and beneath their feet were the bones of the dead eight spreading herbs and flowerets bright glistened with the dew of night nor herb nor floweret glistened there but was carved in the cloister arches as fair the monk gazed long on the lovely moon then into the night he looked forth and red and bright the streamers light were dancing in the glowing north so had he seen in fair castile the youth in glittering squadrons start sudden the flying jennet wheel and hurl the unexpected dart he knew by the streamers that shot so bright that spirits were riding the northern light nine by a steel clenched postern door they entered now the chancel tall the darkened roof rose high aloof on pillars lofty and light and small the keystone that locked each ribbed aisle was a fleur-de-lis or a quatrefeuille the corbels were carved grotesque and grim and the pillars with clustered shafts so trim with base and with capital flourished around seemed bundles of lances which garlands had bound Ten. full many a scutcheon and banner riven shook to the cold night wind of heaven around the screen at altars pale and there the dying lamps did burn before thy low and lonely urn o gallant chief of otterburn and thine dark night of liddesdale o fading honours of the dead o high ambition lowly laid eleven the moon on the east oriel shone through slender shafts of shapely stone by foliaged tracery combined thou wouldst have thought some fairy's hand twixt poplars straight the osier wand in many a freakish knot had twined then framed a spell when the work was done and changed the willow wreaths to stone the silver light so pale and faint showed many a prophet and many a saint whose image on the glass was dyed full in the midst his cross of red triumphant michael brandished and trampled the apostate's pride the moonbeam kissed the holy pain and threw on the pavement a bloody stain twelve they sat them down on a marble stone a scottish monarch slept below thus spoke the monk in solemn tone i was not always a man of woe for Paynim countries I have trod, and fought beneath the cross of God. Now, strange to my eyes, thine arms appear, and their iron clang sounds strange to my ear. 13. In these far climes it was my lot to meet the wondrous Michael Scott, a wizard of such dreaded fame that when in Salamanca's cave him listed his magic wand to wave, the bells would ring in Notre Dame some of his skill he taught to me and warrior i could say to thee the words that cleft eildon hills in three and bridled the tweed with a curb of stone but to speak them were a deadly sin and for having but thought them my heart within a treble penance must be done fourteen when michael lay on his dying bed his conscience was awakened he bethought him of his sinful deed and he gave me a sign to come with speed i was in spain when the morning rose but i stood by his bed ere evening close the words may not again be said 
that he spoke to me on deathbed laid they would rend this abbey's massy nave and pile it in heaps above his grave fifteen i swore to bury his mighty book that never mortal might therein look and never to tell where it was hid save at his chief of branksome's need and when that need was past and o'er again the volume to restore i buried him on st michael's night when the bell tolled one and the moon was bright and i dug his chamber among the dead when the floor of the chancel was stained red that his patron's cross might over him wave and scare the fiends from the wizard's grave sixteen it was a night of woe and dread when michael in the tomb i laid strange sounds along the chancel passed the banners waved without a blast still spoke the monk when the bell tolled one i tell you that a braver man than william of deloraine good at need against a foe ne'er spurred a steed yet somewhat was he chilled with dread and his hair did bristle upon his head seventeen lo warrior now the cross of red points to the grave of the mighty dead within it burns a wondrous light to chase the spirits that love the night that lamp shall burn unquenchably until the eternal doom shall be slow moved the monk to the broad flagstone which the bloody cross was traced upon he pointed to a secret nook an iron bar the warrior took and the monk made a sign with his withered hand the grave's huge portal to expand eighteen with beating heart to the task he went his sinewy frame o'er the gravestone bent with bar of iron heaved amain till the toil drops fell from his brows like rain it was by dint of passing strength that he moved the massy stone at length i would you had been there to see how the light broke forth so gloriously streamed upward to the chancel roof and through the galleries far aloof no earthly flame blazed e'er so bright it shone like heaven's own blessed light and issuing from the tomb showed the monk's cowl and visage pale danced on the dark-browed warrior's mail and kissed his waving plume Nineteen before their eyes the wizard lay as if he had not been dead a day his hoary bead in silver rolled he seemed some seventy winters old a palmer's amiss wrapped him round with a wrought spanish baldric bound like a pilgrim from beyond the sea his left hand held his book of might a silver cross was in his right the lamp was placed beside his knee high and majestic was his look at which the fellest fiends had shook and all unruffled was his face they trusted his soul had gotten grace twenty often had william of deloraine rode through the battle's bloody plain and trampled down the warriors slain and neither known remorse nor awe yet now remorse and awe he owned his breath came thick his head swam round when this strange scene of death he saw bewildered and unnerved he stood and the priest prayed fervently and loud with eyes averted prayed he he might not endure the sight to see of the man he had loved so brotherly twenty one and when the priest his death prayer had prayed thus unto deloraine he said now speed thee what thou hast to do o warrior we may dearly rue for those thou mayst not look upon are gathering fast round the yawning stone then deloraine in terror took from the cold hand the mighty book with iron clasped and with iron bound he thought as he took it the dead man frowned but the glare of the sepulchral light perchance had dazzled the warrior's sight twenty two when the huge stone sunk o'er the tomb the night returned in double gloom for the moon had gone down and the stars were few and as the knight and priest withdrew with wavering steps and dizzy brain they hardly might the postern gain tis said as through the aisles they passed they heard strange noises on the blast 
and through the cloister galleries small which at mid-height thread the chancel wall loud sobs and laughter louder ran and voices unlike the voice of man as if the fiends kept holiday because these spells were brought to-day i cannot tell how the truth may be i say the tale as twas said to me twenty three now hie thee hence the father said and when we are on the death-bed laid o oh, may our dear lady and sweet st john forgive our souls for the deed we have done the monk returned him to his cell and many a prayer and penance sped when the convent met at the noontide bell the monk of st mary's isle was dead before the cross was the body laid with hands clasped fast as if still he prayed twenty four the knight breathed free in the morning wind and strove his hardihood to find he was glad when he passed the tombstones grey which girdle round the fair abbey for the mystic book to his bosom pressed felt like a load upon his breast and his joints with nerves of iron twined shook like the aspen leaves in wind full fain was he when the dawn of day began to brighten cheviot grey he joyed to see the cheerful light and he said ave mary as well as he might twenty five the sun had brightened cheviot grey the sun had brightened the carter's side and soon beneath the rising day smiled branksome towers and teviot's tide the wild birds told their warbling tale and wakened every flower that blows and peeped forth the violet pale and spread her breast the mountain rose and lovelier than the rose so red yet paler than the violet pale she early left her sleepless bed the fairest maid of teviot dale twenty six why does fair margaret so early awake and don her kirtle so hastily and the silken knots which in hurry she would make why tremble her slender fingers to tie why does she stop and look often around as she glides down the secret stair and why does she pat the shaggy bloodhound as he rouses him up from his lair and though she passes the post and alone why is not the watchman's bugle blown twenty seven the lady steps in doubt and dread lest her watchful mother hear her tread the lady caresses the rough bloodhound lest his voice should waken the castle round the watchman's bugle is not blown for he was her foster father's son and she glides through the greenwood at dawn of light to meet baron henry her own true knight twenty eight the knight and lady fair are met and under the hawthorn's bowers are set a fairer pair were never seen to meet beneath the hawthorn green he was stately and young and tall dreaded in battle and loved in hall and she when love scarce told scarce hid lent to her cheek a livelier red when the half sigh her swelling breast against the silken ribbon pressed when her blue eyes their secret told though shaded by her locks of gold where would you find the peerless fair with margaret of branksome might compare twenty nine and now fair dames methinks i see you listen to my minstrelsy your waving locks ye backward throw and sidelong bend your necks of snow ye ween to hear a melting tale of two true lovers in a dale and how the knight with tender fire to paint his faithful passion strove swore he might at her feet expire but never never cease to love and how she blushed and how she sighed and half consenting half denied and said that she would die a maid yet might the bloody feud be stayed henry of cranston and only he margaret of branksome's choice should be thirty alas fair dames your hopes are vain my harp has lost the enchanting strain its lightness would my age reprove my hairs are grey my limbs are old my heart is dead my veins are cold i may not must not sing of love thirty one beneath an oak mossed o'er by eld the baron's dwarf his courser held and held his crested helm and spear 
that dwarf was scarce an earthly man if the tales were true that of him ran through all the border far and near twas said when the baron a hunting rode through reedsdale's glens but rarely trod he heard a voice cry lost 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 and like tennis ball by racket tossed a leap of thirty feet and three made from the gorse this elfin shape distorted like some dwarfish ape and lighted at lord cranston's knee lord cranston was some whit dismayed tis said that five good miles he raid to rid him of his company but where he rode one mile the dwarf ran four and the dwarf was first at the castle door thirty two use lessons marvel it is said this elvish dwarf with the baron stayed little he ate and less he spoke nor mingled with the menial flock and oft apart his arms he tossed and often muttered lost 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 he was waspish arch and lithely but well lord cranston served he and he of his service was full fain for once he had been ta'en or slain and it had not been for his ministry all between home and hermitage talked of lord cranston's goblin page thirty three for the baron went on pilgrimage and took with him this elvish page to mary's chapel of the lows for there beside our lady's lake an offering he had sworn to make and he would pay his vows but the lady of branksome gathered a band of the best that would ride at her command the trysting place was newark lee what of harden came thither amain and thither came john of thirlestane and thither came william of deloraine there were three hundred spears and three through douglas burn up yarrow stream their horses prance their lances gleam they came to st mary's lake ere day but the chapel was void and the baron away they burned the chapel for very rage and cursed lord cranston's goblin page thirty four and now in Branksome's good green wood, as under the aged oak he stood, the baron's courser pricks his ears, as if a distant noise he hears. The dwarf waves his long lean arm on high, and signs to the lovers to part and fly. No time was then to vow or sigh. Fair Margaret through the hazel grove flew like the startled cushat dove. The dwarf the stirrup held, and rein vaulted the knight on his steed amain and pondering deep that morning's scene rode eastward through the hawthorns green while thus he poured the lengthened tale the minstrel's voice began to fail full slyly smiled the observant page and gave the withered hand of age a goblet crowned with mighty wine the blood of veleth's scorched vine he raised the silver cup on high and while the big drop filled his eye prayed god to bless the duchess long and all who cheered a son of song the attending maiden smiled to see how long how deep how zealously the precious juice the minstrel quaffed and he emboldened by the draught looked gaily back to them and laughed the cordial nectar of the bowl swelled his old veins and cheered his soul a lighter livelier prelude ran ere thus his tale again began End of Canto Second Section four of the Lay of the Last Minstrel by Sir Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lay of the Last Minstrel, Canto Third. One. And said I that my limbs were old, and said I that my blood was cold, and that my kindly fire was fled and my poor withered heart was dead and that i might not sing of love how could i to the dearest theme that ever warmed a minstrel's dream so foul so false a recreant prove how could i name love's very name nor wake my heart to notes of flame two in peace love tunes the shepherd's reed in war he mounts the warrior's steed in halls in gay attire is seen in hamlets dances on the green love rules the court the camp the grove and men below and saints above for love is heaven and heaven is love three 
so thought lord cranston as i ween while pondering deep the tender scene he rode through branksome's hawthorn green but the page shouted wild and shrill and scarce his helmet could he don when downward from the shady hill a stately knight came pricking on that warrior's steed so dapple grey was dark with sweat and splashed with clay his armour red with many a stain he seemed in such a weary plight as if he had ridden the livelong night for it was william of deloraine four but no whit weary did he seem when dancing in the sunny beam he marked the crane on the baron's crest for his ready spear was in his rest few were the words and stern and high that marked the foeman's feudal hate for question fierce and proud reply gave signal soon of dire debate their very coursers seemed to know that each was other's mortal foe and snorted fire when wheeled around to give each knight his vantage ground five in rapid round the baron bent he sighed a sigh and prayed a prayer the prayer was to his patron saint the sigh was to his lady fair stout deloraine nor sighed nor prayed nor saint nor lady called to aid but he stooped his head and couched his spear and spurred his steed to full career the meeting of these champions proud seemed like the bursting thunder cloud six stern was the dint the borderer lent the stately baron backwards bent bent backwards to his horse's tail and his plumes went scattering on the gale the tough ash spear so stout and true into a thousand flinders flew but cranston's lance of more avail pierced through like silk the borderer's mail through shield and jack and acton passed deep in his bosom broke at last still sat the warrior saddle fast till stumbling in the mortal shock down went the steed the girthing broke hurled on a heap lay man and horse the baron onward passed his course nor knew so giddy rolled his brain his foe lay stretched upon the plain seven but when he reined his course around and saw his foeman on the ground lie senseless as the bloody clay he bade his page to stanch the wound and there beside the warrior stay and tend him in his doubtful state and lead him to branksome castle gate his noble mind was inly moved for the kinsman of the maid he loved this shalt thou do without delay no longer here myself may stay unless the swifter i speed away short shrift will be at my dying day eight away in speed lord cranston rode the goblin page behind abode his lord's command he ne'er withstood though small his pleasure to do good as the corslet off he took the dwarf espied the mighty book much he marvelled a knight of pride like a book-bosomed priest should ride he thought not to search or stanch the wound until the secret he had found nine the iron band the iron clasp resisted long the elfin grasp for when the first he had undone it closed as he the next begun those iron clasps that iron band would not yield to unchristianed hand till he smeared the cover o'er with the borderer's curdled gore a moment then the volume spread and one short spell therein he read it had much of glamour might could make a lady seem a knight the cobwebs on a dungeon wall seem tapestry in lordly hall a nutshell seem a gilded barge a shilling seem a palace large and youth seem age and age seem youth all was delusion naught was truth ten he had not read another spell when on his cheek a buffet fell so fierce it stretched him on the plain beside the wounded deloraine from the ground he rose dismayed and shook his huge and matted head one word he muttered and no more man of age thou smitest sore no more the elfin page durst try into the wondrous book to pry the clasps though smeared with christian gore shut faster than they were before 
he hid it underneath his cloak now if you ask who gave the stroke i cannot tell so much i thrive it was not given by man alive eleven unwillingly himself he addressed to do his master's high behest he lifted up the living course and laid it on the weary horse he led him into branksome hall before the beards of the warders all and each did after swear and say there only passed a wain of hay he took him to lord david's tower even to the lady's secret bower and but that stronger spells were spread and the door might not be opened he had laid him on her very bed whate'er he did of grammary was always done maliciously he flung the warrior on the ground and the blood welled freshly from the wound twelve as he repassed the outer court he spied the fair young child at sport he thought to train him to the wood for at a word be it understood he was always for ill and never for good seemed to the boy some comrade gay led him forth to the woods to play on the drawbridge the warder's start saw a terrier and a lurcher passing out thirteen he led the boy o'er bank and fell until they came to a woodland brook the running stream dissolved the spell and his own elvish shape he took could he have had his pleasure viled he had crippled the joints of the noble child or with his fingers long and lean had strangled him in fiendish spleen but his awful mother he had in dread and also his power was limited so he but scowled on the startled child and darted through the forest wild the woodland brook he bounding crossed and laughed and shouted lost 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 fourteen full sore amazed at the wondrous change and frightened as a child might be at the wild yell and visage strange and the dark words of grammary the child amidst the forest bower stood rooted like a lily flower and when at length with trembling pace he sought to find where branksome lay he feared to see that grisly face glare from some thicket on his way thus startling oft he journeyed on and deeper in the wood is gone for i the more he sought his way the farther still he went astray until he heard the mountains round ring to the baying of a hound fifteen and hark and hark the deep-mouthed bark comes nigher still and nigher bursts on the path a dark bloodhound his tawny muzzle tracked the ground and his red eye shot fire soon as the wilded child saw he he flew at him right furiously i ween you would have seen with joy the bearing of the gallant boy when worthy of his noble sire his wet cheek glowed twixt fear and ire he faced the bloodhound manfully and held his little bat on high so fierce he struck the dog afraid at cautious distance hoarsely bayed but still in act to spring when dashed an archer through the glade and when he saw the hound was stayed he drew his tough bowstring but a rough voice cried shoot not hoy ho shoot not edward tis a boy sixteen the speaker issued from the wood and checked his fellow's surly mood and quelled the band dog's ire he was an english yeoman good and born in lancashire well could he hit a fallow deer five hundred feet him fro with hand more true and eye more clear no archer bended bow his coal-black hair shorn round and close set off his sunburned face old england's sign st george's cross his barret cap did grace his bugle-horn hung by his side all in a wolfskin baldric tied and his short falchion sharp and clear had pierced the throat of many a deer seventeen his kirtle made of forest green reached scantly to his knee and at his belt of arrows keen a furbished sheaf bore he his buckler scarce in breadth a span no larger fence had he he never counted him a man would strike below the knee his slackened bow was in his hand and the leash that was his bloodhound's band eighteen 
he would not do the fair child harm but held him with his powerful arm that he might neither fight nor flee for when the red cross spied he the boy strove long and violently now by st george the archer cries edward methinks we have a prize this boy's fair face and courage free show he is come of high degree nineteen yes i am come of high degree for i am the heir of bold buccleu and if thou dost not set me free false southron thou shalt dearly rue for walter of harden shall come with speed and william of deloraine good at need and every scot from esk to tweed and if thou dost not let me go despite thy arrows and thy bow i'll have thee hanged to feed the crow twenty gramercy for thy good will fair boy my mind was never set so high but if thou art chief of such a clan and art the son of such a man and ever comest to thy command our wardens had need to keep good order my bow of you to a hazel wand thou'lt make them work upon the border meantime be pleased to come with me for good lord dacre shalt thou see i think our work is well begun when we have taken thy father's son twenty one although the child was led away in branksome still he seemed to stay for so the dwarf his part did play and in the shape of that young boy he wrought the castle much annoy the comrades of the young Buclou he pinched and beat and overthrew nay some of them he well nigh slew he tore dame maudlin's silken tire and as sim hall stood by the fire he lighted the match of his bandolier and woefully scorched the hackbeteer it might be hardly thought or said the mischief that the urchin made till many of the castle guessed that the young baron was possessed twenty two well i ween the charm he held the noble lady had soon dispelled but she was deeply busied then to tend the wounded deloraine much she wondered to find him lie on the stone threshold stretched along she thought some spirit of the sky had done the bold moss trooper wrong because despite her precept dread perchance he in the book had read but the broken lance in his bosom stood and it was earthly steel and wood twenty three she drew the splinter from the wound and with a charm she stanched the blood she bade the gash be cleansed and bound no longer by his couch she stood but she has ta'en the broken lance and washed it from the clotted gore and salved the splinter o'er and o'er william of deloraine in trance whene'er she turned it round and round twisted as if she galled his wound then to her maidens she did say that he should be whole man and sound within the course of a night and day full long she toiled for she did rue mishap to friend so stout and true twenty four so passed the day the evening fell twas near the time of curfew bell the air was mild the wind was calm the stream was smooth the dew was balm e'en the rude watchman on the tower enjoyed and blessed the lovely hour far more fair margaret loved and blessed the hour of silence and of rest on the high turret sitting lone she waked at times the lute's soft tone touched a wild note and all between thought of the bower of hawthorn's green her golden hair streamed free from band her fair cheek rested on her hand her blue eyes sought the west afar for lovers love the western star twenty five is yon the star o'er pencrist pen that rises slowly to her ken and spreading broad its wavering light shakes its loose tresses on the night is yon red glare the western star oh tis the beacon blaze of war scarce could she draw her tightened breath for well she knew the fire of death twenty six the warder viewed it blazing strong and blew his war note loud and long till at the high and haughty sound rock wood and river rung around the blast alarmed the festal hall and startled forth the warriors all far downward in the castle yard full many a torch and cresset glared 
and helms and plumes confusedly tossed were in the blaze half seen half lost and spears in wild disorder shook like reeds beside a frozen brook twenty seven the seneschal whose silver hair was reddened by the torches glare stood in the midst with gesture proud and issued forth his mandates loud on pencrist grows a bale of fire and three are kindling on priestos wire ride out ride out the foe to scout mount mount for Bransom, every man thou todrig warn the johnston clan that ever are true and stout ye need not send to liddesdale for when they see the blazing bale elliot's and armstrong's never fail ride alton ride for death and life and warn the warder of the strife young gilbert let our beacon blaze our kin and clan and friends to raise twenty eight fair margaret from the turret head heard far below the coursers tread while loud the harness rung as to their seats with clamour dread the ready horsemen sprung and trampling hoofs and iron coats and leaders voices mingled notes and out and out in hasty rout the horsemen galloped forth dispersing to the south to scout and east and west and north to view their coming enemies and warn their vassals and allies twenty nine the ready page with hurried hand awaked the need fire's slumbering brand and ruddy blushed to the heaven for a sheet of flame from the turret high waved like a blood flag on the sky all flaring and uneven and soon a score of fires i ween from height and hill and cliff were seen each with warlike tidings fraught each from each the signal caught each after each they glanced to sight as stars arise upon the night they gleamed on many a dusky tarn haunted by the lonely arm on many a cairn's grey pyramid where urns of mighty chiefs lie hid till high Dunedin the blazes saw from Saltra and Dumpenda law, and Lothian heard the regent's order that all should bone them for the border. 30. The livelong night in Branksome rang the ceaseless sound of steel, the castle bell with backward clang sent forth the larum peal, was frequent heard the heavy jar where massy stone and iron bar were piled on echoing keep and tower to whelm the foe with deadly shower was frequent heard the changing guard and watchword from the sleepless ward while wearied by the endless din bloodhound and bandog yelled within thirty one the noble dame amid the broil shared the grey seneschal's high toil and spoke of danger with a smile cheered the young knights and council sage held with the chiefs of riper age no tidings of the foe were brought nor of his numbers knew they aught nor what in time of truce he sought some said that there were thousands ten and others weened that it was naught but leven clans or tyndale men who came to gather in black mail and liddesdale with small avail might drive them lightly back again so passed the anxious night away and welcome was the peep of day ceased the high sound the listening throng applaud the master of the song and marvel much in helpless age so hard should be his pilgrimage had he no friend no daughter dear his wandering toil to share and cheer no son to be his father's stay and guide him on the rugged way ay once he had but he was dead upon the harp he stooped his head and busied himself the strings withal to hide the tear that fain would fall in solemn measure soft and slow arose a father's notes of woe end of canto third section five of the lay of the last minstrel by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain the lay of the last minstrel canto fourth one sweet teviot on thy silver tide the glaring bale fires blaze no more no longer steel-clad warriors ride along thy wild and willowed shore where'er thou winest by dale or hill all all is peaceful all is still as if thy waves since time was born since first they rolled upon the tweed 
had only heard the shepherd's reed nor startled at the bugle horn two unlike the tide of human time which though it change in ceaseless flow retains each grief retains each crime its earliest course was doomed to know and darker as it downward bears is stained with past and present tears low as that tide has ebbed with me it still reflects to memory's eye the hour my brave my only boy fell by the side of great dundee why when the volleying musket played against the bloody highland blade why was not i beside him laid enough he died the death of fame enough he died with conquering graham three now over border dale and fell full wide and far was terror spread for pathless marsh and mountain cell the peasant left his lowly shed the frightened flocks and herds were pent beneath the peel's rude battlement and maids and matrons dropped the tear while ready warriors seized the spear from branksome's towers the watchman's eye dun wreaths of distant smoke can spy which curling in the rising sun showed southern ravage was begun four now loud the heedful gateward cried prepare ye all for blows and blood what tinlin from the liddell side comes wading through the flood full oft the tyndale snatchers knock at his lone gate and prove the lock it was but last st barnabright they seized him a whole summer night but fled at morning well they knew in vain he never twanged the yew right sharp has been the evening shower that drove him from his liddell tower and by my faith the gateward said i think twill prove a warden raid five while thus he spoke the bold yeoman entered the echoing barbican he led a small and shaggy nag that through a bog from hag to hag could bound like any billhope stag it bore his wife and children twain a half-clothed serf was all their train his wife stout ruddy and dark-browed of silver brooch and bracelet proud laughed to her friends among the crowd he was of stature passing tall but sparely formed and lean withal a battered marion on his brow a leathern jack as fencer now on his broad shoulders loosely hung a border axe behind was slung his spear six scottish ells in length seemed newly dyed with gore his shafts and bow of wondrous strength his hardy partner bore six thus to the lady did tinlin show the tidings of the english foe belted will howard is marching here and hot lord dacre with many a spear and all the german hackbutt men who have long lain at Ascaton. they crossed the liddell at curfew hour and burned my little lonely tower the fiend received their souls therefore it had not been burned this year and more barnyard and dwelling blazing bright served to guide me on my flight but i was chased the livelong night black john of akeshaw and fergus graham fast upon my traces came until i turned at priest or scrog and shot their horses in the bog slew fergus with my lance outright i had him long at high despite he drove my cows last fastens night seven now weary scouts from liddersdale fast hurrying in confirmed the tale as far as they could judge by ken three hours would bring to teviot's strand three thousand armoured englishmen meanwhile full many a warlike band from teviot Ail, and ettrick shade came in their chief's defence to aid there was saddling and mounting in haste there was pricking o'er moor and lee he that was last at the trysting place was but lightly held of his gay lady eight from fair st mary's silver wave from dreary gamasclu's dusky height his ready lances thirlstain brave arrayed beneath a banner bright the treasured fleur de luce he claims to wreathe his shield since royal james encamped by fala's mossy wave the proud distinction grateful gave for faith mid feudal jars what time save thirlestain alone of scotland's stubborn barons none would march to southern wars and hence in fair remembrance worn yon sheaf of spears his crest has borne hence his high motto shines revealed 
ready i ready for the field nine an aged knight to danger steeled with many a moss trooper came on and asia in a golden field the stars and crescent graced his shield without the bend of murderston wide lay his hands round oakwood tower and wide round haunted castle o'er high over borthwick's mountain flood his wood embosomed mansion stood in the dark glen so deep below the herds of plundered england low his bold retainers daily food and bought with danger blows and blood marauding chief his sole delight the moonlight raid the morning fight not even the flower of yarrow's charms in youth might tame his rage for arms and still in age he spurned at rest and still his brows the helmet pressed albeit the blanched locks below were white as dinlay's spotless snow five stately warriors drew the sword before their father's band a braver knight than hardin's lord ne'er belted on a brand ten scots of eskdale a stalwart band came trooping down the todshaw hill by the sword they won their land and by the sword they hold it still hearken lady to the tale how thy sires won fair eskdale earl morton was lord of that valley fair the beatisons were his vassals there the earl was gentle and mild of mood the vassals were warlike and fierce and rude high of heart and haughty of word little they recked of a tame liege lord the earl into fair eskdale came homage and seigneury to claim of gilbert the galliard a heriot he sought saying give thy best steed as a vassal ought dear to me is my bonny white steed oft has he helped me at pinch of need lord and earl though thou be i trow i can rein bucksfoot better than thou word upon word gave fuel to fire till so high blazed the beatison's ire but that the earl the flight had ta'en the vassals there their lord had slain saw he plied both whip and spur as he urged his steed through eskdale muir and it fell down a weary weight just on the threshold of branksome gate eleven the earl was a wrathful man to see full fain avenged would he be in haste to branksome's lord he spoke saying take these traitors to thy yoke for a cast of hawks and a purse of gold all eskdale i'll sell thee to have and hold beshrew thy heart of the beatison's clan if thou leavest on esk a landed man but spare wood kerrick's lands alone for he lent me his horse to escape upon a glad man then was branksome bold down he flung him the purse of gold to eskdale soon he spurred amain and with him five hundred riders has ta'en he left his merry men in the mist of the hill and bade them hold them close and still and alone he wended to the plain to meet with the galliard and all his train to gilbert the galliard thus he said know thou me for thy liege lord and head deal not with me as with morton tame for scots play best at the roughest game give me in peace my heriot due thy bonny white steed or thou shalt rue if my horn i three times wind eskdale shall long have the sound in mind twelve loudly the beatison laughed in scorn little care we for thy winded horn ne'er shall it be the galliard's lot to yield his steed to a haughty scot wend thou to branksome back on foot with rusty spur and miry boot he blew his bugle so loud and hoarse that the dun deer startled at fair crack cross he blew again so loud and clear through the grey mountain mist there did lances appear and the third blast rang with such a din that the echoes answered from pentoon lynn and all his riders came lightly in then had you seen a gallant shock when saddles were emptied and lances broke for each scornful word the galliard had said a beatison on the field was laid his own good sword the chieftain drew and he bore the galliard through and through where the beatison's blood mixed with the rill the galliard's whore men call it still the scots have scattered the beatison clan in eskdale they left but one landed man the valley of esk from the mouth to the source was lost and won for that bonny white horse thirteen whitslade the hawk and headshaw came and warriors more than i may name from yarrow clue to hind horse swear from woodhouse lee to chester glen trooped man and horse and bow and spear their gathering word was bellenden 
and better hearts o'er border sod to siege or rescue never rode the lady marked the aids come in and high her heart of pride arose she bade her youthful son attend that he might know his father's friend and learn to face his foes the boy is ripe to look on war i saw him draw a crossbow stiff and his true arrow struck afar the raven's nest upon the cliff the red cross on a southern breast is broader than the raven's nest thou witslade shall teach him his weapon to wield and o'er him hold his father's shield fourteen well may you think the wily page cared not to face the lady sage he counterfeited childish fear and shrieked and shed full many a tear and moaned and plained in manner wild the attendants to the lady told some fairy sure had changed the child that wont to be so free and bold then wrathful was the noble dame she blushed blood-red for very shame hence ere the clan his faintness view hence with the weakling to Buccleuch. what tinlin thou shalt be his guide to wrangleburn's lonely side sure some fell fiend has cursed our line that coward should e'er be son of mine fifteen a heavy task what tinlin had to guide the counterfeited lad soon as the palfrey felt the weight of that ill-omened elfish freight he bolted sprung and reared amain nor heeded bit nor curb nor rein it cost what tinlin mickle toil to drive him but a scottish mile but as a shallow brook they crossed the elf amid the running stream his figure changed like form in dream and fled and shouted lost 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 full fast the urchin ran and laughed but faster still a cloth-yard shaft whistled from startled tinlin's yew and pierced his shoulder through and through although the imp might not be slain and though the wound soon healed again yet as he ran he yelled for pain and what of tinlin much aghast rode back to branksome fiery fast sixteen soon on the hill's steep verge he stood that looks o'er branksome's towers and wood and martial murmurs from below proclaimed the approaching southern foe through the dark wood in mingled tone were border pipes and bugles blown the courser's neighing he could ken a measured tread of marching men while broke at times the solemn hum the almain's sullen kettle drum and banners tall of crimson sheen above the copse appear and glistening through the hawthorn's green shine helm and shield and spear seventeen light foreigners first to view the ground spurred their fleet coursers loosely round behind in close array and fast the kendal archers all in green obedient to the bugle blast advancing from the wood were seen to back and guard the archer band lord dacre's billmen were at hand a hardy race on earthing bred with kirtles white and crosses red arrayed beneath the banner tall that streamed o'er acres conquered wall and minstrels as they marched in order played noble lord dacre he dwells on the border eighteen behind the english bill and bow the mercenaries firm and slow moved on to fight in dark array by conrad led of wolfenstein who brought the band from distant rhine and sold their blood for foreign pay the camp their home their law the sword they knew no country owned no lord they were not armed like england's sons but bore the levin darting guns buff coats all franced and broidered o'er and morsing horns and scarfs they wore each better knee was bared to aid the warriors in the escalade all as they marched in rugged tongue songs of teutonic feuds they sung nineteen but louder still the clamour grew and louder still the minstrels blew when from beneath the greenwood tree rode forth lord howard's chivalry his men-at-arms with glaive and spear brought up the battle's glittering rear there many a youthful knight full keen to gain his spurs in arms was seen with favour in his crest or glove memorial of his lady love so rode they forth in fair array till full their lengthened lines display then called a halt and made a stand and cried st george for merry england twenty now every english eye intent on branksome's armoured towers was bent so near they were that they might know the straining harsh of each crossbow on battlement and bartizan gleamed axe and spear and partisan 
falcon and culver on each tower stood prompt their deadly hail to shower and flashing armour frequent broke from eddying whirls of sable smoke where upon tower and turret head the seething pitch and molten lead reeked like a witch's cauldron red while yet they gaze the bridges fall the wicked opes and from the wall rides forth the hoary seneschal twenty one armoured he rode all save the head his white beard o'er his breastplate spread unbroke by age erect his seat he ruled his eager courser's gait forced him with chastened fire to prance and high curvetting slow advance in sign of truce his better hand displayed a peeled willow wand his squire attending in the rear bore high a gauntlet on a spear when they espied him riding out lord howard and lord dacre stout sped to the front of their array to hear what this old knight should say twenty two ye english warden lords of you demands the lady of buccleuch why gainst the truce of border tide in hostile guise ye dare to ride with kendal bow and gilsland brand and all yon mercenary band upon the bounds of fair scotland my lady reads you swift return and if but one poor straw you burn or do our towers so much molest as scare one swallow from her nest st mary but we'll light a brand shall warm your hearths in cumberland twenty three a wrathful man was dacre's lord but karma howard took the word may it please thy dame sir seneschal to seek the castle's outward wall our pursuivant at arms shall show both why we came and when we go the message sped the noble dame to the wall's outward circle came each chief around leaned on his spear to see the pursuivant appear all in lord howard's livery dressed the lion argent decked his breast he led a boy of blooming hue o oh, sight to meet a mother's view it was the heir of great buccleuch obeisance meet the herald made and thus his master's will he said twenty four it irks high dame my noble lords gainst lady fair to draw their swords but yet they may not tamely see all through the western wardenry your law contemning kinsmen ride and burn and spoil the border side and ill beseems your rank and birth to make your towers a flemen's firth we claim from thee william of deloraine that he may suffer march treason pain it was but last st cuthbert's even he pricked to stapleton on leven harried the lands of richard musgrave and slew his brother by dint of glaive then since a lone and widowed dame these restless riders may not tame either receive within thy towers two hundred of my master's powers or straight they sound their warrison and storm and spoil thy garrison and this fair boy to london led shall good king edward's page be bred twenty five he ceased and loud the boy did cry and stretched his little arms on high implored for aid each well-known face and strove to seek the dame's embrace a moment changed that lady's cheer gushed to her eye the unbidden tear she gazed upon the leaders round and dark and sad each warrior frowned then deep within her sobbing breast she locked the struggling sigh to rest unaltered and collected stood and thus replied in dauntless mood twenty six say to your lords of high emprise who wore on women and on boys that either william of de Lorraine will cleanse him by oath of march treason stain or else he will the combat take against musgrave for his honour's sake no knight in cumberland so good but william may count with him kin and blood knighthood he took of douglas's sword when english blood swelled ancrum's ford and but lord dacre's steed was white and bare him ably in the flight himself had seen him dubbed a knight for the young heir of Branksome's line, God be his aid and God be mine. Through me no friend shall meet his doom. Here, while I live, no foe finds room. Then if thy lords their purpose urge, take our defiance loud and high. Our slogan is their like wake dirge. Our moat the grave where they shall lie. 27. Proud she looked round, applause to claim then lightened thurston's eye of flame his bugle what of harden blew 
pencils and pennons wide were flung to heaven the border slogan rung st mary for the young buclou the english war cry answered wide and forward bent each southern spear each kendall archer made a stride and drew the bowstring to his ear each minstrel's war note loud was blown but ere a grey goose shaft had flown a horseman galloped from the rear twenty eight ah noble lords he breathless said what treason has your march betrayed what make you here from aid so far before you walls around you war your foemen triumph in the thought that in the toils the lions caught already on dark rubus law the douglas holds his weapon sure the lancers waving in his train clothed the dun heath like autumn grain and on the liddell's northern strand to bar retreat to cumberland lord maxwell ranks his merry men good beneath the eagle and the rood and jedwood esk and teviotdale have to proud angus come and all the Mers and lauderdale have risen with haughty hume an exile from northumberland in liddesdale i've wandered long but still my heart was with merry england and cannot brook my country's wrong and hard i've spurred all night to show the mustering of the coming foe twenty nine and let them come fierce dacre cried for soon yon crest my father's pride that swept the shores of judah's sea and waved in gales of galilee from branksome's highest towers displayed shall mock the rescue's lingering aid level each harquebus on row draw merry archers draw the bow up bill men to the walls and cry dacre for england win or die thirty yet here quoth howard calmly here nor deem my words the words of fear for who in field or foray slack saw the blanched lion e'er fall back but thus to risk our border flower in strife against a kingdom's power ten thousand scots gainst thousands three certes were desperate policy nay take the terms the lady made ere conscious of the advancing aid let musgrave meet fierce deloraine in single fight and if he gain he gains for us but if he's crossed tis but a single warrior lost the rest retreating as they came avoid defeat and death and shame thirty one ill could the haughty dacre brook his brother warden's sage rebuke and yet his forward step he stayed and slow and sullenly obeyed but ne'er again the border side did these two lords in friendship ride and this slight discontent men say cost blood upon another day thirty two the poor swivant at arms again before the castle took his stand his trumpet called with parleying strain the leaders of the scottish band and he defied in musgrave's right stout deloraine to single fight a gauntlet at their feet he laid and thus the terms of fight he said if in the lists good musgrave's sword vanquish the knight of deloraine your youthful chieftain branksome's lord shall hostage for his clan remain if deloraine foil good musgrave the boy his liberty shall have howe'er it falls the english band unharming scots by scots unharmed in peaceful march like men unarmed shall straight retreat to cumberland thirty three unconscious of the near relief the proffer pleased each scottish chief though much the lady sage gainsaid for though their hearts were brave and true from jedwood's recent sack they knew how tardy was the regent's aid and you may guess the noble dame durst not the secret prescience own sprung from the art she might not name by which the coming help was known closed was the compact and agreed that lists should be enclosed with speed beneath the castle on a lawn they fixed the morrow for the strife on foot with scottish axe and knife at the fourth hour from peep of dawn when deloraine from sickness freed or else a champion in his stead should for himself and chieftain stand against stout musgrave hand to hand thirty four i know right well that in there lay full many minstrels sing and say such combat should be made on horse on foaming steed in full career with brand to aid when as the spear should shiver in the course but he the jovial harper taught me yet a youth how it was fought 
in guise which now i say he knew each ordinance and clause of black lord archibald's battle laws in the old douglas's day he brooked not he that scoffing tongue should tax his minstrelsy with wrong or call his song untrue for this when they the goblet plied and such rude taunt had chafed his pride the bard of rule he slew on teviot's side in fight they stood and tuneful hands were stained with blood where still the thorns white branches wave memorial o'er his rival's grave thirty five why should i tell the rigid doom that dragged my master to his tomb how usnam's maidens tore their hair wept till their eyes were dead and dim and wrung their hands for love of him who died at jedward air he died his scholars one by one to the cold silent grave are gone and i alas survive alone to muse o'er rivalries of awe and grieve that i shall hear no more the strains with envy heard before for with my minstrel brethren fled my jealousy of song is dead he paused the listening dames again applaud the hoary minstrel's strain with many a word of kindly cheer in pity half and half sincere marvelled the duchess how so well his legendary song could tell of ancient deeds so long forgot of feuds whose memory was not of forests now laid waste and bare of towers which harbour now the hare of manners long since changed and gone of chiefs who under their grey stone so long had slept that fickle fame had blotted from her rolls their name and twined round some new minion's head the fading wreath for which they bled in sooth twas strange this old man's verse could call them from their marble hearse the harper smiled well pleased for ne'er was flattery lost on poets ear a simple race they waste their toil for the vain tribute of a smile e'en when in age their flame expires her dulcet breath can fan its fires their drooping fancy wakes at praise and strives to trim the short-lived blaze smiled then well pleased the aged man and thus his tale continued ran End of Canto Fourth Section Six of The Lay of the Last Minstrel by Sir Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lay of the Last Minstrel, Canto Fifth. One. Call it not vain. They do not err who say that when the poet dies mute nature mourns her worshipper and celebrates his obsequies who say tall cliff and cavern lone for the departed bard make moan that mountains weep in crystal rill that flowers in tears of balm distill through his loved groves that breezes sigh and oaks in deeper groan reply and rivers teach their rushing wave to murmur dirges round his grave Two not that in sooth or mortal urn those things inanimate can mourn but that the stream the wood the gale is vocal with the plaintive wail of those who else forgotten long lived in the poet's faithful song and with the poet's parting breath whose memory feels a second death the maid's pale shade who wails her lot that love true love should be forgot from rose and hawthorn shakes the tear upon the gentle minstrel's bier the phantom knight his glory fled mourns o'er the field he heaped with dead mounts the wild blast that sweeps amain and shrieks along the battle plain the chief whose antique crown at long still sparkled in the feudal song now from the mountain's misty throne sees in the thanedom once his own his ashes undistinguished lie his place his power his memory die his groans the lonely caverns fill his tears of rage impel the rill all mourn the minstrel's harp unstrung their name unknown their praise unsung three scarcely the hot assault was stayed the terms of truce were scarcely made when they could spy from branksome's towers the advancing march of martial powers thick clouds of dust afar appeared and trampling steeds were faintly heard 
bright spears above the columns dun glanced momentary to the sun and feudal banners fair displayed the bands that moved to branksome's aid four veils not to tell each hardy clan from the fair middle marches came the bloody heart blazed in the van announcing douglas dreaded name Vails not to tell what steeds did spurn, Where the seven spears of Wedderburn Their men in battle order set, And Swinton laid the lance in rest, That tamed of yore the sparkling crest Of Clarence's Plantagenet. Nor list I say what hundreds more From the rich Meurs and Lammermoor, And Tweed's fair borders to the war Beneath the crest of old Dunbar, And Hepburn's mingled banners Come down the steep mountain glittering far, And shouting still, a whom, a whom, Five. now squire and knight from branksome sent on many a courteous message went to every chief and lord they paid meet thanks for prompt and powerful aid and told them how a truce was made and how a day of fight was ta'en twixt musgrave and stout deloraine and how the lady prayed them dear that all would stay the fight to see and deign in love and courtesy to taste of branksome cheer nor while they bade to feast each scot were england's noble lords forgot himself the hoary seneschal rode forth in seemly terms to call those gallant foes to branksome hall accepted howard than whom knight was never dubbed more bold in fight nor when from war and armour free more famed for stately courtesy but angry dacre rather chose in his pavilion to repose six now noble dame perchance you ask how these two hostile armies met deeming it were no easy task to keep the truce which here was set where martial spirits all on fire breathed only blood and mortal ire by mutual inroads mutual blows by habit and by nation foes they met on teviot's strand they met and sat them mingled down without a threat without a frown as brothers meet in foreign land the hands the spear that lately grasped still in the mailed gauntlet clasped were interchanged in greeting dear visors were raised and faces shone and many a friend to friend made known partook of social cheer some drove the jolly bowl about with dice and draught some chased the day and some with many a merry shout in riot revelry and rout pursued the football play seven yet be it known had bugles blown or sign of war been seen those bands so fair together ranged those hands so frankly interchanged had dyed with gore the green the merry shout by teviot's side had sunk in war cries wild and wide and in the groan of death and whingers now in friendship bare the social meal to part and share had found a bloody sheath twixt truce and war such sudden change was not infrequent nor held strange in the old border day but yet on branksome's towers and town in peaceful merriment sunk down the sun's declining ray eight the blithesome signs of wassail gay decayed not with the dying day soon through the latticed windows tall of lofty branksome's lordly hall divided square by shafts of stone huge flakes of ruddy lustre shone nor less the gilded rafters rang with merry harp and beakers clang and frequent on the darkening plain loud hollow whoop or whistle ran as bands their stragglers to regain give the shrill watchword of their clan and revellers o'er their bowls proclaim douglas or dacre's conquering name nine less frequent heard and fainter still at length the various clamours died and you might hear from branksome hill no sound but teviot's rushing tide save when the changing sentinel the challenge of his watch could tell and save where through the dark profound the clanging axe and hammer's sound rung from the nether lawn for many a busy hand toiled there strong pails to shape and beams to square the lists dread barriers to prepare against the morrow's dawn Ten. margaret from hall did soon retreat despite the dame's reproving eye nor marked she as she left her seat full many a stifled sigh for many a noble warrior strove to win the flower of teviot's love and many a bold ally with throbbing head and anxious heart all in her lonely bower apart in broken sleep she lay 
by times from silken couch she rose while yet the bannered hosts repose she viewed the dawning day of all the hundreds sunk to rest first woke the loveliest and the best eleven she gazed upon the inner court which in the tower's tall shadow lay where coursers clang and stamp and snort had rung the livelong yesterday now still as death till stalking slow the jingling spurs announced his tread a stately warrior passed below but when he raised his plumed head blessed mary can it be secure as if in usnam bowers he walks through branksome's hostile towers with fearless step and free she dared not sign she dared not speak oh if one page's slumbers break his blood the price must pay not all the pearls queen mary wears not margaret's yet more precious tears shall buy his life a day twelve yet was his hazard small for well you may bethink you of the spell of that sly urchin page this to his lord he did impart and made him seem by glamour art a knight from hermitage unchallenged thus the warder's post the court unchallenged thus he crossed for all the vassalage but oh what magic's quaint disguise could blind fair margaret's azure eyes she started from her seat while with surprise and fear she strove and both could scarcely master love lord henry's at her feet thirteen oft have i mused what purpose bad that foul malicious urchin had to bring this meeting round for happy love's a heavenly sight and by a vile malignant sprite in such no joy is found and oft i've deemed perchance he thought their erring passion might have wrought sorrow and sin and shame and death to cranston's gallant knight and to the gentle lady bright disgrace and loss of fame but earthly spirit could not tell the heart of them that loved so well true love's the gift which god has given to man alone beneath the heaven it is not fantasy's hot fire whose wishes soon as granted fly it liveth not in fierce desire with dead desire it doth not die it is the secret sympathy the silver link the silken tie which heart to heart and mind to mind in body and in soul can bind now leave we margaret and her knight to tell you of the approaching fight fourteen their warning blasts the bugles blew the pipe's shrill port aroused each clan in haste the deadly strife to view the trooping warriors eager ran thick round the lists their lances stood like blasted pines in ettrick wood to branksome many a look they threw the combatants approached to view and bandied many a word of boast about the night each favoured most fifteen meantime full anxious was the dame for now arose disputed claim of who should fight for deloraine twixt harden and twixt thurlistane they gan to reckon kin and rent and frowning brow on brow was bent but yet not long the strife for lo himself the knight of deloraine strong as it seemed and free from pain in armour sheathed from top to toe appeared and craved the combat due the dame her charm successful knew and the fierce chiefs their claims withdrew sixteen when for the lists they sought the plain the stately lady's silken rein did noble howard hold unarmoured by her side he walked and much in courteous phrase they talked of feats of arms of old costly his garb his flemish ruff fell o'er his doublet shaped of buff with satin slashed and lined tawny his boot and gold his spur his cloak was all of pole and fur his hose with silver twined his bilboa blade by marchmen felt hung in a broad and studded belt hence in rude phrase the borderers still called noble howard belted will seventeen behind lord howard and the dame fair margaret on her palfrey came whose footcloth swept the ground white was her wimple and her veil and her loose locks a chaplet pale of whitest roses bound the lordly angus by her side in courtesy to cheer her tried without his aid her hand in vain had strove to guide her broidered rein he deemed she shuddered at the sight of warriors met for mortal fight but cause of terror all unguessed was fluttering in her gentle breast when in their chairs of crimson placed the dame and she the barriers graced 
18. Prize of the field, the young Buclou, an English knight, led forth to view. Scarce rude the boy his present plight, so much he longed to see the fight. Within the lists in knightly pride, high Hume and haughty Dacre ride. Their leading staffs of steel they wield, as marshals of the mortal field. While to each knight their care assigned like vantage of the sun and wind. Then Herald's horse did loud proclaim in king and queen and warden's name that none, while lasts the strife, should dare by look or sign or word aid to a champion to afford on peril of his life. And not a breath the silence broke, till thus the alternate heralds spoke. 19. English Herald Here standeth Richard of Musgrave, good knight and true, and freely born amends from deloraine to crave for foul dispiteous scathe and scorn he saith that william of deloraine is traitor false by border laws this with his sword he will maintain so help him god and his good cause twenty scottish herald here standeth william of deloraine good knight and true of noble strain who saith that foul treason's stain since he bore arms ne'er soiled his coat and that so help him god above he will on musgrave's body prove he lies most foully in his throat lord dacre forward brave champions to the fight sound trumpets lord hume god defend the right then teviot how thine echoes rang when bugle sound and trumpet clang let loose the martial foes and in mid-list with shield poised high and measured step and wary eye the combatants did close 21. Ill would it suit your gentle ear, ye lovely listeners, to hear how to the axe the helms did sound, and blood poured down from many a wound, for desperate was the strife and long, and either warrior fierce and strong. But were each dame a listening knight, I well could tell how warriors fight, for I have seen war's lightning flashing, seen the claymore with bayonet clashing, seen through red blood the war-horse dashing and scorned amid the reeling strife to yield a step for death or life twenty two tis done tis done that fatal blow has stretched him on the bloody plain he strives to rise brave musgrave no thence never shalt thou rise again he chokes in blood some friendly hand undo the visor's barred band unfix the gorget's iron clasp and give him room for life to gasp o oh, bootless aid haste holy friar haste ere the sinner shall expire of all his guilt let him be shriven and smooth his path from earth to heaven twenty three in haste the holy friar sped his naked foot was dyed with red as through the lists he ran unmindful of the shouts on high that hailed the conqueror's victory he raised the dying man loose waved his silver beard and hair and o'er him he kneeled down in prayer and still the crucifix on high he holds before his darkening eye and still he bends an anxious ear his faltering penitence to hear still props him from the bloody sod still even when soul and body part pours ghostly comfort on his heart and bids him trust in god unheard he prays the death pangs o'er Richard of Musgrave breathes no more. 24. As if exhausted in the fight, or musing o'er the piteous sight, the silent victor stands. His beaver he did not unclasp, marked not the shouts, felt not the grasp of gratulating hands. When, lo, strange cries of wild surprise, mingled with seeming terror, rise among the Scottish bands and all amid the thronged array in panic haste gave open way to a half-naked ghastly man who downward from the castle ran he crossed the barriers at a bound and wild and haggard looked around as dizzy and in pain and all upon the armoured ground knew william of deloraine each lady sprung from seat with speed vaulted each marshal from his steed and who art thou they cried who hast this battle fought and won his plumed helm was soon undone. Cranston of Teviot's side. For this fair prize I've fought and won, and to the lady led her son. 25. 
full oft the rescued boy she kissed and often pressed him to her breast for under all her dauntless show her heart had throbbed at every blow yet not lord cranston deigned she greet though low he kneeled at her feet me lists not tell what words were made what douglas hume and howard said for howard was a generous foe and how the clan united prayed the lady would the feud forego and deign to bless the nuptial hour of cranston's lord and teviot's flower twenty six she looked to river looked to hill thought on the spirit's prophecy then broke her silence stern and still not you but fate has vanquished me their influence kindly stars may shower on teviot's tide and branksome's tower for pride is quelled and love is free she took fair margaret by the hand who breathless trembling scarce might stand that hand to cranston's lord gave she as i am true to thee and thine do thou be true to me and mine this clasp of love our bond shall be for this is your betrothing day and all these noble lords shall stay to grace it with their company twenty seven all as they left the listed plain much of the story she did gain how cranston fought with deloraine and of his page and of the book which from the wounded knight he took and how he sought her castle high that morn by help of grammary how in sir william's armour dight stolen by his page while slept the night he took on him the single fight but half his tale he left unsaid and lingered till he joined the maid cared not the lady to betray her mystic arts in view of day but well she thought ere midnight came of that strange page the pride to tame from his foul hands the book to save and send it back to michael's grave needs not to tell each tender word twixt margaret and twixt cranston's lord nor how she told of former woes and how her bosom fell and rose while he and musgrave bandied blows needs not these lovers joys to tell one day fair maids you'll know them well twenty eight william of deloraine some chance had wakened from his death-like trance and taught that in the listed plain another in his arms and shield against fierce musgrave axe did wield under the name of deloraine hence to the field unarmed he ran and hence his presence scared the clan who held him for some fleeting wraith and not a man of blood and breath not much this new ally he loved yet when he saw what hap had proved he greeted him right heartily he would not wake an old debate for he was void of rancorous hate though rude and scant of courtesy in raids he spilt but seldom blood unless when men-at-arms withstood or as was meet for deadly feud he ne'er bore grudge for stalwart blow ta'en in fair fight from gallant foe and so it was seen of him e'en now when on dead musgrave he looked down grief darkened on his rugged brow though half disguised with a frown and thus while sorrow bent his head his foeman's epitaph he made twenty nine now richard musgrave liest thou here i ween my deadly enemy for if i slew thy brother dear thou slewest a sister's son to me and when i lay in dungeon dark of naworth castle long months three till ransomed for a thousand mark dark musgrave it was long of thee and musgrave could our fight be tried and thou wert now alive as i no mortal man should us divide till one or both of us did die yet rest thee god for well i know i ne'er shall find a nobler foe in all the northern counties here whose word is snaffle spur and spear thou wert the best to follow gear twas pleasure as we looked behind to see how thou the chase couldst wind cheer the dark bloodhound on his way and with the bugle rouse the fray i'd give the lands of deloraine dark musgrave were alive again thirty so mourned he till lord dacre's band were boning back to cumberland they raised brave musgrave from the field and laid him on his bloody shield on levelled lances four and four by turns the noble burden bore before at times upon the gale was heard the minstrel's plaintive wail behind four priests in sable stole sung requiem for the warrior's soul 
around the horsemen slowly rode with trailing pikes the spearmen trod and thus the gallant knight they bore through liddesdale to levens shore thence to holm coltrame's lofty nave and laid him in his father's grave the harp's wild notes though hushed the song the mimic march of death prolong now seems it far and now anear now meets and now eludes the ear now seems some mountain side to sweep now faintly dies in valley deep seems now as if the minstrel's wail now the sad requiem loads the gale last o'er the warrior's closing grave rung the full choir in choral stave after due pause they bade him tell why he who touched the harp so well should thus with ill-rewarded toil wander a poor and thankless soil when the more generous southern land would well requite his skilful hand the aged harper howsoe'er his only friend his harp was dear liked not to hear it ranked so high above his flowing poesy less liked he still that scornful jeer misprized the land he loved so dear high was the sound as thus again the bard resumed his minstrel strain end of canto fifth section seven of the lay of the last minstrel by sir walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain the lay of the last minstrel canto sixth one breathes there the man with soul so dead who never to himself hath said this is my own my native land whose heart hath ne'er within him burned as home his footsteps he hath turned from wandering on a foreign strand if such there breathe go mark him well for him no minstrel raptures swell high though his titles proud his name boundless his wealth as wish can claim despite those titles power and pelf the wretch consented all in self living shall forfeit fair renown and doubly dying shall go down to the vile dust from whence he sprung unwept unhonoured and unsung two o caledonia stern and wild meet nurse for a poetic child land of brown heath and shaggy wood land of the mountain and the flood land of my sires what mortal hand can e'er untie the filial band that knits me to thy rugged strand still as i view each well-known scene think what is now and what hath been seems as to me of all bereft sole friends thy woods and streams were left and thus i love them better still even in extremity of ill by yarrow's streams still let me stray though none should guide my feeble way still feel the breeze down ettrick break although it chill my withered cheek still lay my head by teviot stone though there forgotten and alone the bard may draw his parting groan three not scorned like me to branksome hall the minstrels came at festive call trooping they came from near and far the jovial priests of mirth and war alike for feast and fight prepared battle and banquet both they shared of late before each martial clan they blew their death note in the van but now for every merry mate rose the portcullis's iron grate they sound the pipe they strike the string they dance they revel and they sing till the rude turrets shake and ring four me lists not at this tide declare the splendour of the spousal rite how mustered in the chapel fair both maid and matron squire and knight me lists not tell of ouchers rare of mantles green and braided hair and kirtles furred with miniver what plumage waved the altar round how spurs and ringing chainlets sound and hard it were for bard to speak the changeful hue of margaret's cheek that lovely hue which comes and flies as awe and shame alternate rise five some bards have sung the lady high chapel or altar came not nigh nor durst the rites of spousal grace so much she feared each holy place 
false slanders these i trust right well she wrought not by forbidden spell for mighty words and signs have power o'er sprites in planetary hour yet scarce i praise their venturous part who tamper with such dangerous art but this for faithful truth i say the lady by the altar stood of sable velvet her array and on her head a crimson hood with pearls embroidered and entwined guarded with gold with ermine lined a merlin sat upon her wrist held by a leash of silken twist six the spousal rites were ended soon twas now the merry hour of noon and in the lofty arched hall was spread the gorgeous festival steward and squire with heedful haste marshalled the rank of every guest pages with ready blade were there the mighty meal to carve and share or capon heron shoe and crane and princely peacock's gilded train and o'er the boar-head garnished brave and signet from st mary's wave or ptarmigan and venison the priest had spoke his benison then rose the riot and the din above beneath without within for from the lofty balcony rung trumpet shawm and psaltery their clanging bowls old warriors quaffed loudly they spoke and loudly laughed whispered young knights in tone more mild to ladies fair and ladies smiled the hooded hawks high perched on beam the clamour joined with whistling scream and flapped their wings and shook their bells in concert with the staghounds yells round go the flasks of ruddy wine from bordeaux orleans or the rhine their tasks the busy sewers ply and all is mirth and revelry seven the goblin page omitting still no opportunity of ill strove now while blood ran hot and high to rouse debate and jealousy till conrad lord of wolfenstein by nature fierce and warm with wine and now in humour highly crossed about some steeds his band had lost high words to words succeeding still smote with his gauntlet stout hunthill a hot and hardy rutherford whom men called dickon draw the sword he took it on the pages say hunthill had driven these steeds away then howard hume and douglas rose the kindling discord to compose stern rutherford right little said but bit his glove and shook his head a fortnight thence in inglewood stout conrad cold and drenched in blood his bosom gored with many a wound was by a woodman's lime dog found unknown the manner of his death gone was his brand both sword and sheath but ever from that time twas said that dickon wore a cologne blade eight the dwarf who feared his master's eye might his foul treachery espy now sought the castle buttery where many a yeoman bold and free revelled as merrily and well as those that sat in lordly cell what tinlin there did frankly raise the pledge to arthur fire the braes and he as by his breeding bound to howard's merry men sent it round to quit them on the english side red roland forster loudly cried a deep carouse to yon fair bride at every pledge from vat and pail foamed forth in floods the nut-brown ale while shout the riders every one such day of mirth ne'er cheered their clan since old buccleu the name did gain when in the clue the buck was ta'en nine the wily page with vengeful thought remembered him of tinlin's yew and swore it should be dearly bought that ever he the arrow drew first he the yeoman did molest with bitter gibe and taunting jest told how he fled at solway's strife and how hob armstrong cheered his wife then shunning still his powerful arm at unawares he wrought him harm from trencher stole his choicest cheer dashed from his lips his can of beer then to his knee sly creeping on with bodkin pierced him to the bone the venomed wound and festering joint long after rued that bodkin's point the startled yeoman swore and spurned and board and flagons overturned riot and clamour wild began back to the hall the urchin ran took in a darkling nook his post and grinned and muttered lost 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 Ten. by this the dame lest father fray should mar the concord of the day had bid the minstrel's tune there lay and first stepped forth old albert graham the minstrel of that ancient name 
was none who struck the harp so well within the land debatable well friended too his hardy kin whoever lost were sure to win they sought the beeves that made their broth in scotland and in england both in homely guise as nature bad his simple song the borderer said eleven albert graham it was an english lady bright the sun shines fair on carlisle wall and she would marry a scottish knight for love will still be lord of all blithely they saw the rising sun when he shone fair on carlisle wall but they were sad ere day was done though love was still the lord of all her sire gave brooch and jewel fine where the sun shines fair on carlisle wall her brother gave but a flask of wine for ire that love was lord of all for she had lands both meadow and lea where the sun shines fair on carlisle wall and he swore her death ere he would see a scottish knight the lord of all twelve that wine she had not tasted well the sun shines fair on carlisle wall when dead in her true love's arms she fell for love was still the lord of all he pierced her brother to the heart where the sun shines fair on carlisle wall so perish all would true love part that love may still be lord of all and then he took the cross divine where the sun shines fair on carlisle wall and died for her sake in palestine so love was still the lord of all now all ye lovers that faithful prove the sun shines fair on carlisle wall pray for their souls who died for love for love shall still be lord of all thirteen as ended albert's simple lay arose a bard of loftier port for sonnet rhyme and roundelay renowned in haughty henry's court there rung thy harp unrivalled long fitz traver of the silver song the gentle surrey loved his lyre who has not heard of surrey's fame his was the hero's soul of fire and his the bard's immortal name and his was love exalted high by all the glow of chivalry fourteen they sought together climbs afar and oft within some olive grove when even came with twinkling star they sung of surrey's absent love his step the italian peasant stayed and deemed that spirits from on high round where some hermit saint was laid were breathing heavenly melody so sweet did harp and voice combine to praise the name of geraldine fifteen fitztraver oh what tongue may say the pangs thy faithful bosom knew when surrey of the deathless lay ungrateful tudor's sentence slew regardless of the tyrant's frown his harp called wrath and vengeance down he left for Nelworth's iron towers windsor's green glades and courtly bowers and faithful to his patron's name with howard still fitztraver came lord william's foremost favourite he and chief of all his minstrelsy sixteen fitztraver twas all souls eve and surrey's heart beat high he heard the midnight bell with anxious start which told the mystic hour approaching nigh when wise cornelius promised by his art to show to him the lady of his heart albeit betwixt them roared the ocean grim yet so the sage had height to play his part that he should see her form in life and limb and mark if still she loved and still she thought of him seventeen dark was the vaulted room of gramarye to which the wizard led the gallant knight save that before a mirror huge and high a hallowed taper shed a glimmering light on mystic implements of magic might on cross and character and talisman and almagest and altar nothing bright for fitful was the lustre pale and wan as watchlight by the bed of some departing man eighteen but soon within that mirror huge and high was seen a self-emitted light to gleam and forms upon its breast the earl gan spy cloudy and indistinct as feverish dream till slow arranging and defined they seemed to form a lordly and a lofty room part lighted by a lamp with silver beam 
placed by a couch of agra's silken loom and part by moonshine pale and part was hid in gloom nineteen fair all the pageant but how passing fair the slender form which lay on couch of ind o'er her white bosom strayed her hazel hair pale her dear cheek as if for love she pined all in her night-robe loose she lay reclined and pensive read from tablet ebonine some strain that seemed her inmost soul to find that favoured strain was surrey's raptured line that fair and lovely form the lady geraldine twenty slow rolled the clouds upon the lovely form and swept the goodly vision all away so royal envy rolled the murky storm o'er my beloved master's glorious day thou jealous ruthless tyrant heaven repay on thee and on thy children's latest line the wild caprice of thy despotic sway the gory bridal bed the plundered shrine the murdered surrey's blood the tears of geraldine twenty one both scots and southern chiefs prolong applauses of fitztravers song these hated henry's name as death and those still held the ancient faith then from his seat with lofty air rose harold bard of brave st clair st clair who feasting high at hume had with that lord to battle come harold was born where restless seas howl round the storm-swept orcades where erst st clair's held princely sway o'er isle and islet straight and bay still nods their palace to its fall thy pride and sorrow fair kirkwall then soft he marked fierce pentland rave as if grim odin rode her wave and watched the whilst with visage pale and throbbing heart the struggling sail for all of wonderful and wild had rapture for the lonely child twenty two and much of wild and wonderful in these rude isles might fancy cull for thither came in times afar stern lachlan's sons of roving war the norsemen trained to spoil and blood skilled to prepare the raven's food kings of the main their leaders brave their barks the dragons of the wave and there in many a stormy vale the scald had told his wondrous tale and many a runic column high had witnessed grim idolatry and thus had harold in his youth learned many a saga's rhyme uncouth of that sea-snake tremendous curled whose monstrous circle girds the world of those dread maids whose hideous yell maddens the battle's bloody swell of chiefs who guided through the gloom by the pale death-lights of the tomb ransacked the graves of warriors old their falchions wrenched from corpses hold waked the deaf tomb with war's alarms and bade the dead arise to arms with war and wonder all on flame to roslin's bowers young harold came where by sweet glen and greenwood tree he learned a milder minstrelsy yet something of the northern spell mixed with the softer numbers well twenty three harold oh listen listen ladies gay no haughty feat of arms i tell soft is the note and sad the lay that mourns the lovely rosabel more more the barge ye gallant crew and gentle lady deign to stay rest thee in castle ravensew nor tempt the stormy firth to-day the blackening wave is edged with white to inch and rock the sea-mews fly the fishes have heard the water sprite whose screams forebode that wreck is nigh last night the gifted seer did view a wet shroud swathed round lady gay then stay thee fair in ravenshew why cross the gloomy firth to-day tis not because lord lindsay's heir to-night at roslin leads the ball but that my lady mother there sits lonely in her castle hall tis not because the ring they ride and lindsay at the ring rides well but that my sire the wine will chide if tis not filled by rosabel o'er roslin all that dreary night a wondrous blaze was seen to gleam twas broader than the watchfire's light and redder than the bright moonbeam it glared on roslin's castled rock it ruddied all the copsewood glen twas seen from dryden's groves of oak and seen from caverned hawthornden 
seemed all on fire that chapel proud where rosalind's chiefs uncoffined lie each baron for a sable shroud sheathed in his iron panoply seemed all on fire within around deep sacristy and altars pale shone every pillar foliage bound and glimmered all the dead men's mail blazed battlement and pinnet high blazed every rose carved buttress fair so still they blaze when fate is nigh the lordly line of high st clare there are twenty of rosalind's barons bold lie buried within that proud chapelle each one the holy vault doth hold but the sea holds lovely rosabel and each st clare was buried there with candle with book and with knell but the sea caves rung and the wild winds sung the dirge of lovely rosabel twenty four so sweet was harold's piteous lay scarce marked the guests the darkened hall though long before the sinking day a wondrous shade involved them all it was not eddying mist or fog drained by the sun from fen or bog of no eclipse had sages told and yet as it came on apace each one could scarce his neighbour's face could scarce his own stretched hand behold a secret horror checked the feast and chilled the soul of every guest even the high dame stood half aghast she knew some evil on the blast the elvish page fell to the ground and shuddering muttered found found twenty five then sudden through the darkened air a flash of lightning came so broad so bright so red the glare the castle seemed on flame glanced every rafter of the hall glanced every shield upon the wall each trophied beam each sculptured stone were instant seen an instant gone full through the guests bedazzled band resistless flashed the levin brand and filled the hall with smouldering smoke as on the elvish page it broke it broke with thunder long and loud dismayed the brave appalled the proud from sea to sea the larum rung on berwick hall and at carlisle withal to arms the startled warders sprung when ended was the dreadful roar the elvish dwarf was seen no more twenty six some heard a voice in branksome hall some saw a sight not seen by all that dreadful voice was heard by some cry with loud summons gilben come and on the spot where burst the brand just where the page had flung him down some saw an arm and some a hand and some the waving of a gown the guests in silence prayed and shook and terror dimmed each lofty look but none of all the astonished train was so dismayed as deloraine his blood did freeze his brain did burn twas feared his mind would ne'er return for he was speechless ghastly wan like him of whom the story ran who spoke the spectre-hound in man at length by fits he darkly told with broken hint and shuddering cold that he had seen right certainly a shape with amos wrapped around with a wrought spanish baldric bound like pilgrim from beyond the sea and knew but how it mattered not it was the wizard michael scott Twenty seven. The anxious crowd, with horror pale, all trembling heard the wondrous tale. No sound was made, no word was spoke, till noble Angus silence broke, and he a solemn sacred plight did to St. Bride of Douglas make, that he a pilgrimage would take to Melrose Abbey for the sake of Michael's restless sprite. Then each, to each his troubled breast, to some blessed saint his prayers addressed some to st modan made their vows some to st mary of the lows some to the holy rood of lyle some to our lady of the isle each did his patron witness make that he such pilgrimage would take and monks should sing and bells should toll all for the weal of michael's soul while vows were ta'en and prayers were prayed tis said the noble dame dismayed renounced for i dark magic's aid Twenty eight. Nought of the bridal will I tell, which after in short space befell, nor how brave sons and daughters fair blessed Teviot's flower and Cranston's heir. After such dreadful scene, twere vain to wake the note of mirth again. 
more meet it were to mark the day of penitence and prayer divine when pilgrim chiefs in sad array sought melrose's holy shrine twenty nine with naked foot and sackcloth vest and arms enfolded on his breast did every pilgrim go the standers by might hear uneath footstep or voice or high drawn breath through all the lengthened row no lordly look nor martial stride gone was their glory sunk their pride forgotten their renown silent and slow like ghosts they glide to the high altar's hallowed side and there they knelt them down above the suppliant chieftains wave the banners of departed brave beneath the lettered stones were laid the ashes of their fathers dead from many a garnished niche around stern saints and tortured martyrs frowned thirty and slow up the dim aisle afar with sable cowl and scapular and snow-white stoles in order due the holy fathers two and two in long procession came taper and host and book they bear and holy banner flourished fair with the redeemer's name above the prostrate pilgrim band the mitred abbot stretched his hand and blessed them as they kneeled with holy cross he signed them all and prayed they might be sage in hall and fortunate in field then mass was sung and prayers were said and solemn requiem for the dead and bells tolled out their mighty peal for the departed spirits wheel and ever in the office close the hymn of intercession rose and far the echoing aisles prolong the awful burthen of the song dies ire dies illa solvet seclum in favilla while the pealing organ rung were it meet with sacred strain to close my lay so light and vain thus the holy fathers sung thirty one hymn for the dead that day of wrath that dreadful day when heaven and earth shall pass away what power shall be the sinner's stay how shall he meet that dreadful day when shrivelling like a parched scroll the flaming heavens together roll when louder yet and yet more dread swells the high trump that wakes the dead oh on that day that wrathful day when man to judgment wakes from clay be thou the trembling sinner's stay though heaven and earth shall pass away hushed is the harp the minstrel gone and did he wander forth alone alone in indigence and age to linger out his pilgrimage no close beneath proud newark's tower arose the minstrel's lowly bower a simple hut but there was seen the little garden hedged with green the cheerful hearth and lattice clean there sheltered wanderers by the blaze oft heard the tale of other days for much he loved to ope his door and give the aid he begged before so passed the winter's day but still when summer smiled on sweet bow hill and july's eve with balmy breath waved the bluebells on newark heath when throstles sung in harehead shore and corn was green on carterhaw and flourished broad black andro's oak the aged harper's soul awoke then would he sing achievements high and circumstance of chivalry till the rapt traveller would stay forgetful of the closing day and noble youths the strain to hear forsook the hunting of the deer and yarrow as he rolled along bore burden to the minstrel's song end of canto sixth end of the lay of the last minstrel by sir walter scott